Good morning and good afternoon <clears throat> um, um, to the first event of the project uh, Diploing Architect German Trained Indonesian Architects uh, from the 1960s. My name is Moritz Henning and I'm uh, part of the curatorial team <clears throat> um, and one of the initiators of the platform Encounters with Southeast Asian Modernism, which is dedicated to the exchange on modern architecture between Germany and Southeast Asia. With us in the virtual space are Sally Belo and Eduard Kögel, my Berlin partners um, um, at the Ed Carters project. Um, okay, before we get into the symposium, <clears throat> I would like to give a quick introduction to our work with the Encounters platform. The project came into being in 2019 uh, when Germany celebrated uh, the 100th anniversary, an, an anniversary of the Bauhaus. Uh, in this context, we were keen to break up the rather narrow view of architectural modernism as a Western invention and to bring Southeast Asia in focus. In August 2019, we invited architects, curators, artists, and academics from Southeast Asia <clears throat> uh, to Berlin. So later that year, and this is what you see now on the slide, um, exhibitions, symposia, workshops, architectural tours, and film screenings that negotiated how to deal with post-colonial modern architecture were curated by the teams in Jakarta, Phnom Penh, uh, Singapore, and Yangon. If you'd like to browse it a bit later, this is all documented on our website. In 2021, we were able to bring these exhibitions to Berlin, supplemented by a contribution on the architecture and planning export of East and West Germany to the region. The exhibition entitled Contested Modernities, Postcolonial Architecture in Southeast Asia was shown at Haus der Statistik, uh, to be translated as House of Statistics, a late East German modernist building that was saved from demolition through the commitment of civil society. Contested Modernities also included a publication at four symposia. <clears throat> Without going too much into details, it would now, I would now, now like to say a few words about the project uh, Dippling um, Arsitect itself. It was in August 2019 when we sat down in Berlin with Avianti Armand and Setiadi Supandi, the curators of the uh, Indonesian contribution to the Encounters project. We knew that some of the architects who were instrumental in shaping modern Indonesian architecture since the 1960s had studied in Germany and decided to look for more information. And uh, indeed, in the archives of the Technical University Berlin, we discovered the documentation of the final projects of nine Indonesian students who graduated in 1960 and 1961 with a degree in architecture, the so-called Diplom Ingenieur Architektur in Bahasa Indonesia, Diplom in Arsitek. This is where the title comes from. This finding was the inspiration for our project that consists of an exhibition that will start on 12th December in Jakarta, a publication that will come out by the end of the year, and two symposia today and on 15th December. Well, today, <clears throat> Johannes Vidodo, who has been part of the Encounters uh, Network from the beginning, will guide us through the day. He's an associate professor at the Department of Architecture at the National University of Singapore. And his research focuses on history and theory of architecture, architectural morphology and typology, as well as architectural conservation and heritage management. <laughs> but uh, I'm afraid it will take, I think our entire three hours to mention all of Johannes activities. So I will stop here. Johannes, please, please forgive me for this. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, <clears throat> before leaving the screen, I would like to mention another important issue. Um, we are always excited by the way the exchange on architecture in Germany and Indonesia with Avianti and Setiadi and their team now functions since 2019, and we hope it will continue in the future. Because we think that this is, is this exchange offers great potential 
we all here as architects, planners, um, and but also as common people <clears throat> face great challenges. It would be a great waste not to make use of the experience available on both sides. It was for reasons like this that Indonesian students came to Berlin almost 70 years ago. And it is exactly how we can look to Indonesia today, a country where so many exciting and different things are happening. Finally, <clears throat> I'd like to thank those who made this project possible. It was for the second time, the German Federal Foreign Office that accepted one of our proposals. This time as part of the program to celebrate the 17th, 17th anniversary of diplomatic relations between Germany and Indonesia and provided us with the necessary funding. We would also like to thank the Archive and Architecture Museum of the Technical University of Berlin for keeping the work of the Indonesian students and providing us with further information on the education of architects back then. Okay, what you see on the slide is uh, um, are some excerpts from the diplomas um, of these architects, how they are preserved in the in the in the archive of the Technical University. Now I would like to hand over <coughs> to Setiadi Zapandi in Indonesia. Uh, Setiadi is a practicing architect based in Bogor and an architectural historian by training. And he is a co-founder, curator, and director of Yayasan Museum Architectura Indonesia, the first and only architectural repository, the first and only online architectural repository in Indonesia. And he is part of the curatorial team of Dipling Arzitek. Setiadi, the screen is yours. Okay. Thank you, Moritz. I'd like to share my screen. Uh... Okay, I think I just used this format, sorry. <laughs> uh, okay, thank you for it, for the kind and thorough introduction of our works together. Uh, it is our honor and pleasure to have the opportunities uh, working in encounters in uh, Southeast Asian modernism. Uh, my name is Tia Desopandi on behalf of the Yayasan Museum Architecture Indonesia or Indonesian Architecture Museum Foundation, or better known as architecturindonesia.org. I would like to welcome all of you to our chain of events beginning from today, December the 1st, 2022, until the 12th January, 2023. Uh, which is our, this is which is our uh, second collaboration with our Berliners colleagues, Sally, Moritz, Edward, and their team, a wonderful team. It has been delightful and productive endeavor working with them and we wish this opportunity also bears good fruits. It's, it's obvious that we share common interests and align to conduct projects centered on how we can harvest our recent architectural past to provide us some hints, knowledge, wisdom to face our contemporary needs and the coming challenges. For our site in Indonesia, uh, architecturindonesia.org is aspired to grow beyond just an online repository uh, website. We'd like to, to place architecturindonesia.org as an institute that collects, preserves, processes, produces, and disseminates architectural knowledge, especially those which are related in, to the works of Indonesian architects, architecture in Indonesia, and the, the extents of the architects' works, uh, not only uh, limited to buildings, urban infrastructures, but also urban design, plots, and words. By doing so, we believe that we are contributing to the building of Indonesian architectural historiography and our own architectural knowledge, which are largely underrepresented in national architectural education and practice. A little over than five years, we have established an online archive with 18 collections, dozens of mini online exhibitions, followed by four major exhibitions offline, three publications and three awards, and we strive to do much more in the near future. We put a great interest in physical archives, drawings, notes, photographs, artifacts, built works, as well as digital ones, digital stills and moving images and other form of digital archive. Even though we are only collect and share digitized archive, we also immense or immerse ourselves in the physical ones. We know and understand how the digital traces of architectural works can only give you so much knowledge, while the real objects, real people and real places will be able to move and inspire us. 
In the preparation of the exhibition, Deep in Architect, German educated Indonesian architects from the 1960s, we begin with a little knowledge, but generous help from our colleagues and friends who are more than willing to support us by providing information, connecting us to the right directions and don't write helping us with facilities and access to precious archival collections. We are also delightful as our team is actually literally getting younger and bigger. For this project working with us, there are 11 dedicated young architectural curators and researchers and a dozen of designers carefully tending the archive uh, materials and bringing stories out of them. This exhibition as briefly explained earlier was initiated as a growing seed that we germinate during these past few months. It is far from being comprehensive, let alone complete. We are still lacking time and effort to dig deeper on few protagonists while we cover quite a lot on some. But the point of having the project is that the seed eventually sprout and promises uh, fruitful branches for future explorations. The archive that we select and arrange can eventually start to tell us architectural stories personal journeys, and more clues for the future uh, journey. And within the next few days, we will share some of these stories with you. So I'm telling you that have a good symposium today and thank you. Yes, I think it's Johannes' turn to-, to All right, start. let's start um, because we're already 15 minutes behind schedules. Oh my well, God. <laughs> it will be a very uh, interesting uh, evening for us in Southeast Asia and wonderful morning in, in Germany. So um, let me just briefly introduce about this, this uh, first symposium. We will have second symposiums later in the 15th of December. So this first symposium, the title is the Between Past and Future, New Forms of Design, Constructions and Material Cultures. So I think what is interesting about this symposium is not just about nostalgia. Of course, we understand in Indonesia it's about new word, architect data book, about powerhouse, about our um, education of architecture starts from modernisms coming from, from Bauhaus. But we are not just talking about the utopia and the euphoria of the past. The, the discussions this afternoon, I think, will reflect more on the issue of global warming, of depletion of resources, and also the real problems that we face in our earth today, especially in relation to carbon. And the presenters also will discuss something about sustainability, technology, and strategy of the future. We are quite lucky to have six uh, good uh, speakers this afternoon. We have uh, Muhammad Nandia Widyarta, uh, Alvi Shaab, and then uh, Philip Miselwich, Nadia Purestri, Ima Anidia Hermawan, and Dani Hermawan. And finally, um, Nani Grau. So is uh, speakers from both uh, German and Indonesia will, will uh, give uh, their perspectives on, on this issue, uh, moving from the past into the present and the future. So first I will call upon um, the first speaker, uh, Muhammad Nanda Widarta uh, from the Department of Architecture, University of Indonesia, now as a PhD candidate at the University of New South Wales in Australia. Um, uh, Nanda uh, will speak about uh, uh, to answer, trying to answer the questions. Why is building done by the way it's done? So I think uh, the, the presentations will be quite interesting. And you have um, 10 minutes to present your case. And then we will have a uh, coffee time. Right? We, we, let, let's make this a more informal. It's not like an academic forum but uh, maybe a better dialogue uh, about the, the topics um, through conversations. So Nanda? Sure, uh, allow me to uh, share my screen. And yeah, I'll try my best to, uh, to get it fast. Uh, can you see it? Yes. All right, so thank you for having me. I'm going to present, the, you know, in order to answer the question, I'm going to present the flow of building materials and expert expertise in relation to modern architecture in Indonesia. Of, of course, my focus will be on post-independence era as that's the relevant period uh, to our bigger, bigger, bigger theme. 
uh, pertaining uh, to Germany and Indonesia relationship. So this is just a little story that I start with a, a hardboard uh, factory um, in Banyuwangi, founded in 1954. Uh, it's specializing in making hardboard using uh, coconut fiber. Uh, the technology actually came from West Germany. And the hardware from this factory in the mid 50s as well um, was participated. In fact, it was the, the product that was used uh, in an experiment for constructing a house within several hours, and they succeeded on that uh, for the purpose of mass housing uh, in the 1950s. And it was supervised by Mohammad Hatta himself, the vice president. But that's a little story. Actually, I'm going to present the bigger story now. Um, if, you, if you look at post-independence modernist buildings in Indonesia, especially the ones uh, commissioned by the Indonesian government between 1959 to 1965, during Sukarno era, all of these buildings either use, uh, not either, sorry, um, all these buildings use reinforced concrete and pre-stressed concrete. Therefore, two materials are dominant, Portland cement and steel. So this is uh, the Islam Mosque, by the way, under construction. So generally speaking, the flow of materials and expertise in Indonesia was due to conditions set by political and economic interests during both the colonial and independence period. That I will get back to it uh, at the end of my presentation. Of course, uh, I have to mention a bit about what happened prior to independence um, during the colonial era. Uh, the flow of expertise started in, let's say, in the 1900s when architects and engineers came from Europe uh, bringing new ideas in architecture, construction methods, etc. and so forth. And therefore, there was a demand for uh, materials such as steel and uh, Portland cement because uh, this was a time when construction methods such as uh, the Hennepin kind of uh, reinforced concrete was used uh, in Indonesia as this building in 1908 in Semarang, uh, the Higea Mineral Water Factory, uh, was built using uh, reinforced concrete. Now, before the Second World War, Indonesia imported cement from Portland cement, that is, uh, from the Netherlands, Germany, the United States, and Japan. Um, in addition, in 1912, uh, the Indarum cement factory was built, uh, you know, trying to produce cement by itself. In, within Indonesia domestically. And an American report also shows that structural iron and steel were imported from the US as well, but it is possible that some other sources uh, were also available prior to the Second World War. Now, let's jump to the independence era. After uh, the transfer of sovereignty, I'm talking about 1949, uh, Indonesia found itself in a very bad economic situation, so therefore steps had to be taken to improve uh, uh, the economy. One of the steps was the urgency industrial program uh, enacted in March 1951. That is to say, industrialization of Indonesia. That was because the, it was thought that uh, industrialization will, will develop the economy as in Indonesia as you know it will instigate or trigger um, education, et cetera, and so forth, as well as it provides uh, commodity, processed commodities for Indonesia you know, to make some money. Uh, but the problem is that Indonesia lacked the money and the expertise to industrialize itself. Therefore, foreign aid was necessary. Um, foreign aid came from various um, uh, sources. Remember, it was a cold war, the Cold War era. Uh, Indonesia was in the middle of it, so Indonesia played with it, with, with, this, with this situation, so that Indonesia managed to get um, aid from everybody, so, so to speak. One of the results of the, uh, the UIP was, aside from the harbor um, factory in Banyuwangi, one of the, another result was the Gresik Man Plan, inaugurated in 1957. Uh, this was possible due to American help, uh, American money from the Export Import Bank of Washington, involving around 1,000 U.S. suppliers, two U.S. companies, uh, SK Ferguson and Morrison International, and uh, planned and built uh, the factory 
Um, the ICA, the International Cooperation Agency or US government body now known as the USAID, uh, funded the training of the Indonesian staff. Uh, why is it important? Uh, uh, I'll tell you why uh, on, on that slide. But another cement plant was also built in Tonasa, Sulawesi, uh, inaugurated in 1968. It was thanks to the financial and technical assistance from Czechoslovakia. Now, I mentioned the, the Gresik plan because it is it, this is important. Uh, because, uh, why is it important? Because the plan supplied Portland cement to all modern buildings commissioned by the government between the 1959 and 1965, whether we talk about the Mosque, uh, National Monument, Hotel Indonesia, or any other uh, important buildings, they, they were supplied by this particular factory. Now, in spite of uh, the, the uh, opening of those two new cement plants to open the one uh, built during the colonial era at Indarum, Sumatra, uh, demand was high uh, and cement had to be imported. Um, I read somewhere that there was a Romanian cement. I forgot the, the, the brand, but, but the main source of Portland cement import to Indonesia was Japan, uh, as, as this uh, advertisement uh, shows. Uh, whereas steel, well, reinforced uh, concrete requires steel, steel had to be imported from various um, um, sources such as the US, Japan, and Australia, among others. Um, what's going on? Okay. And there were also other non-structural materials such as pipes. Uh, Pralon is an Indonesian brand, still important. And glass from the Soviet Union, China, etc. and so forth. But uh, I'm gonna skip it. So all right. When the National Monument was designed and built, expertise and materials from various sources were involved. Um, cement from Indonesia, Gresik, of course, uh, steel from Japan. Electrical installation from West Germany, um, Siemens, in fact, marble from Italy. Um, of course, uh, experts from Japan, uh, West Germany, and Italy were involved as well. Um, Pre-stress pre concrete was used uh, in this project. Um, possibly, I have to say possibly, um, and the suggestion by an Indonesian civil engineer hired for this particular project, Prusena Surahadi Kusomo. Uh, Rusena Suryohadi Kusomo had been um, sent to France in the early 1950s to learn about pre-stress concrete. Uh, West Germany, um, in particular, um, was very important in uh, the foundation of steel industry in Indonesia. In 1962, actually, it didn't start with West Germany. It started with the Soviet Union. In 1962, uh, the USSR agreed to aid Indonesia to build uh, this steel factory in Cilegon, um, western part of Java. The problem, uh, the problem was in 1965 there was this coup d'état in Jakarta, and due to that, in you know, a political situation not so good, uh, Soviet experts had have had to leave. Um, Chilagon in 1966, so it was a so the whole project was abandoned in 1966, but it was continued in 1970s with West German involvement, and I listed the uh, German companies uh, involved in that: Ferrostal, Siemens, Klopner, MAN, Salzgitter, Kochtiv, Diwida, Zublin, and in fact, uh, the whole e Soviet equipment had to be replaced uh, at the suggestion of German experts because. For, for two reasons. First, uh, the Soviet equipment had rusted, not good anymore. And second, after anyway, uh, those equipment would only produce inferior quality steel. So the German experts uh, prof, uh, suggested and provided better equipment for Krakatau steel. That's how Krakatau steel was found. Now, regarding expertise, there was materials, there is expertise. I've mentioned that European experts came to colonial Indonesia in the early 20th century. Um, it, there were also a few Indonesians who went overseas to study architecture, mainly in to the Netherlands, such as Flingwanji, for instance. 
uh, somebody from Semarang. In addition, uh, the Technical Hoc School of Bandung, who would become the Institute of Technology Bandung now, was established in 1920, offering civil engineering program, and architecture was a part of it, of that civil engineering program at that time. Uh, the, I mentioned Ruseno Suryohadi Kusumo, who was involved in the National Monument Project. He was an alumnus of this uh, school. Um, also, uh, since the colonial era, there have been publications that disseminate ideas and knowledge in the field of architecture and engineering, such as the, this uh, publication that I listed. And there, there was also another one, the IBT. I forgot what it stands for, but usually architects would write something else in IBT since the 1930s, 20s, 30s. So this publication serves as important media in the formation of expertise in Indonesia. Now, we talk about, I talk about the industrialization as part of it, of course, expertise had to be formed. Um, and foreign aid was important in the expansion of Indonesian uh, university system in the 1950s. Um, a lot of countries were involved in it, although one Indonesian historian, Farah Bifaki, mentioned that it was mostly Americans. So there was also an uh, uh, aid from the United Nations uh, when they helped us uh, to establish the regional housing center in Bandung in 1953, uh, where a lot of experts from other countries such as West Germany, uh, the US, Britain, Australia, Scandinavian countries were available there. Now, the Technicia or, 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 or Red School uh, founded in during the colonial era that I mentioned, still there. And it and in 1959, it became the Bandung Institute of Technology. Uh, architecture and civil engineering programs, now they are separated. Um, they, you know, they depended on Dutch academics at first, but starting in 1956, there were Americans uh, who came to that school, as well as Austrians. Now, what is the significance of their arrival? The Dutch introduced the Indonesian students to you know, does architects such as Berlage, Dudok, etc., and so forth, whereas the Americans and the Austrians uh, introduced them to the Corbusi, Miss Van der Rohe, uh, etc., et and so forth. So something happened also in 1958. The curricula of both civil engineering and architecture programs shows emphasis on modern materials, cement and steel, in particular, and construction, reinforced concrete. This is after the American influence coming in and after the foundation of uh, the crisis plan in 1957, interestingly. Uh, in addition, there were Indonesians and overseas uh, using scholarship from various gov um, foreign governments. And those who came back with a diploma engineer and degree were some of them, of course. Uh, well, this is one of the results of those. Um, the Conifa building, uh, a modernist building, uh, designed in 1965 and built in 1965 as well, um, was designed by none other than the person whose name I, you know, I, 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 I did that, you know. Uh, it, it was designed by Suyo Diwiryo Atmojo, an alumnus of the Technical University of Berlin. All right. He was not the only one uh, who, uh, and I'm sure um, the uh, exhibition creators will can talk more about it. Now I am back to the uh, flow of expert materials and, and expertise, as well as funding. Uh, why did it came from? Well, one of the reasons, the Cold War. Uh, Indonesia, like India and some other countries, played uh, the competition of both Western and Eastern blocs. So Indonesia received uh, aid from all sides. Uh, to illustrate this, uh, I'll show you about two projects uh, to prepare Jakarta to host the fourth Asian Games in 1962, the sports venue at Senayan and Hotel Indonesia. 
uh, okay, sports venue, who got who are involved there? The techno export from the Soviet Union, of course, uh, the Soviet help Indonesia for this. They provided financial and technical uh, aid. Steel, aluminium, glass, piping, etc., were supplied from the USSR. All shipped from Odessa, now Ukraine. Portland men from Gresik, that's Indonesian. However, uh, some Danish white men were also used. But it is interesting that Toyota of Japan supplied trucks for this project. Shell, the Anglo Dutch oil company, supplied fuel for all the vehicles and equipments. Now, Hotel Indonesia, designed by Americans, American architects, built by Indonesian contractor, backed up by a Japanese company, Taisei. The engineering services by Julius Berger Tiefbau. Uh, Julius Berger had been involved in Hilton Hotel in Istanbul uh, in 1953 or four. I don't really remember. Uh, piling equipment came from Hamburg. Um, some American engineering help as well. Funding from Japan. Steel supplied by a Japanese company, Kinoshita, which had merged to Mitsui, I believe. Um, and the hotel itself was managed by American corporation, the Inter Intercontinental Hotel Corporation, up to 1985. So there, this is this illustrates that a lot of uh, people, a lot of actors uh, representing all sides of the Cold War were involved in that. But what's going on here? Well. I'm almost at the end. Uh, the flow of expertise and materials necessary for the development of modern Indonesian architecture started during the 20th century, part of the colonial period, which I already um, mentioned earlier. Now, after the decolonization, after the independence, that is to say, uh, there was a paradigm in developing newly independent countries or less developed countries, let's say so. According to this, to this paradigm, uh, funding expertise and technology from the West would bring development to these new countries. Uh, uh, even though technically the Soviet Union was not the West, but the, U, but the Soviet Union also subscribed apparently uh, to subscribe to this uh, belief and the Indonesian government also subscribed to this belief. Uh, if we look at the decision to enact industrialization in 1951, that's uh, behind that there was this belief as well. That's why uh, foreign aid was, uh, was sought after. This has effect to the flow of expertise, technology, building materials in Indonesia. Um, this is similar to the development of knowledge on tropical architecture as discussed by somebody from the NUS, uh, Singapore, Jiat Wee Chang, which was also conducted under the same paradigm. Um, uh, this paradigm retained a relationship between the newly independent and the for, formerly colonized countries and the former colonizer metropoles. Um, perhaps we can see the similarity to the center semi periphery periphery relationship proposed by Emmanuel Wallerstein. Of course, Indonesia had its own position, uh, important position in uh, during the Cold War, as you know, the Asian African Conference, the Alignment Movement, its geographical um, location, as it and so forth, and Indonesia played played the competition between the two blocks of the Cold War for its own purposes. Yet, yet the position of Indonesia among the newly independent nations and its natural resources and geographical location give various countries reason to assist Indonesia in many areas, willingly assist Indonesia for that, because they have something to, uh, you know, to fulfill. So there was political and economic agendas um, of everybody, not, 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 not just the West, but also the East blocks, uh, probably some actors in Indonesia itself as well. Uh, now, this is how the flow of expertise, materials, technology, and sometimes funding to construct modern buildings uh, from 1950s to 1970s took place in Indonesia. Um, 
So my last um, slide will be this one. Within such a context of developmentalist kind of uh, paradigm, one architect uh, graduated from Aachen in 1966, uh, Yusuf Biliarta Mauni Wijaya, did something different. Uh, in one of his projects, uh, the improvement of Kalicho, the settlement uh, for the poorest there, uh, completed in 1985, used materials that were relatively low cost and low tech, if you like, uh, available locally, could be maintained by anybody. This seems to be a res his response to the situation, to the developmentalist kind of paradigm that he was facing. Um, I, I hope I made it clear. Um, if not, well, there is this Q and A um, um, session. Thank you. Thank you, Nanda. Thank you very much. I think this is very interesting thesis when you start with the uh, the intertwining between the so-called modernism, the ideology, and geopolitics with economic sovereignty. That all this use of materials and uh, education and so on is 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 highly uh, related to say like foreign aid debt, uh, import and the coup d'état. So it's it's all uh, uh, become like um, uh, uh, cause and and the effect of of one another. But I think the last statement that you make is very interesting because if you compare two agencies, one is Suyudi with uh, Mangun Wijaya. Uh, it's, it's very interesting because you, you use UD as one of the examples that representing the, the era of the Cold War and the post-Cold War and the early Sukarno era. And then um, uh, at the end of or the mid of Suharto era comes another alumni from Germany with his Mangun Vijaya. Uh, maybe it's not because he's from Germany, but maybe because he's a priest. But <laughs> anyway, this uh, two ideology has become like antithesis of the, the geopolitical uh, things. So uh, I think uh, let, let's wait for, for the, the question and answer later. We continue the discussion yeah. at the end of the sessions. Uh, sure. uh, so we, can, we should move forward because it's already 5.45 in Singapore and 4.45 in Indonesia. Uh, I will introduce the second speaker uh, that will continue the, the, the conversations. Pa'alwi uh, Shaaf, an architect, urban observer and PhD candidate at urban sociology at the University of Indonesia that will discuss more about the metropolis, the idea of the urbanism of Indonesia. Paulvi? Yep. Thank you, Pak. Allow me to share the screen. So good morning and good after afternoon, everyone. Uh, allow me to uh, share the screen. I probably go very fast because the time is not apparently not so much left for us. Yeah? So I'm talking about uh, the situation in Jakarta, the situation of uh, the city in Jakarta, of Jakarta. Yeah? Um, I come with the uh, thinking of if you plan cities for cars and traffic, you will certainly get cars and traffic. But if you plan for people and places, you will get people and places in your city. So I have uh, briefly, I uh, have uh, made this uh, scheme uh, just to say about, there are two types of the city in Jakarta. First one is on the north side where the European colonization uh, built the city and which is more human oriented. But then after we build the city, after the independence, uh, the city will become more uh, car oriented. Yeah, uh, I put here also the influence of Fordism where people uh, tend to buy the cars, where people thought the uh, measurement of uh, successful should be having some cars. What is the uh, result? The result is human as actor as victim, and we forgot the human aspect in our uh, design of uh, planning as of city. The population in Jakarta, you can see growth from 1870 with 65,000 up to 1960, where uh, Pananda was just mentioning, where we had the Asian Games, it's about 2.9 million. And then 2020, we have 10 million or almost 11 million people living in Jakarta. And uh, 58 to 48 uh, point percent, you will see that people doesn't have any uh, house to save. 
I'm then questioning, do we have equity in uh, Jakarta? Are we very diverse? Yes, we are very diverse, but does this diversity help Jakarta? Are we planning our city uh, with democracy? So in total, I'll say, I would say that we have a city which uh, reflecting injustice. Jakarta has been always a sweet sugar city. People come from everywhere in, the, uh, in Jakarta, in, from Indonesia, they just come to earn the money. So the popular city, there are uh, uh, place and there are services coming from uh, hospitals. And usually those people coming to Jakarta to work are more from the uh, low end uh, part. And then when we see the city, there's the integration of the city planning. I think we miss how to design a city, how to plan a city, and how to build a city. Um, this is just briefly to show how many um, migrants come to Jakarta and also go back to Jakarta. With this slide, I would just uh, try to say that there is no uh, loyalty at all from the Jakartans who live in Jakarta or most of the Jakartans who live in Jakarta because they do not belong to Jakarta. They also doesn't have that sense of belonging to Jakarta. Um, to see these uh, two graphics, you will see that we grow from uh, 1961, 2.97 to 10 million, as I mentioned before. But one interesting to find out is that nowadays in 2020, the composition of the uh, inhabitants, almost 85% are the young people. So you can imagine we are in a productive, they are in a productive age and they are, they are, living, they are living in Jakarta. 85% almost from the uh, generation X, uh, Z, the millennial, and also post generation Z. Yeah, because of what? Because again, uh, they are looking for sugar. You know? And uh, we built the city, we built the sweet spot, we built uh, the city right in the center, and we almost forget how to build another part of the city. If you look at Jakarta, this is the uh, boulevard of Jakarta, Jalan Tamrin and Jalan Sudirman. How does it look like? This is Jalan Tamrin. Uh, the photos, uh, the image uh, at the top is showing 1965, where Hotel Indonesia was just mentioned by Pak Ananda. And uh, this is 2020. You will see that uh, there are more larger pedestrians where people can walk uh, in Jakarta. But how do people walk? People walk in the street, which is, has a ROW 61.5 meter, which means you are very small little ends in the big city like this. Right? There is no human scale. There is no... Uh, 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 Right, correct pedestrian for people to walk and also crossing the uh, street, especially and go further to the Sudirman Street. This is even worse. Yeah? It's hard to walk in the city. If you want to go from one end to the uh, uh, opposite of the building, you have to move around, uh, walking far away or even taking cars to move around the city. Then you can arrive uh, a build, uh, in a building which is just opposite to where you are. People also, uh, the government of Jakarta like to build a lot of uh, commuting uh, line and uh, traffic uh, transportation uh, line just to be able to, com uh, 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 pop to sustain a lot of uh, people going from Jakarta and to Jakarta. Now, this is a sample that I would like to show. Uh, the Bundaran HI is where the Pananda was mentioning the hotel in Malaysia is on the left side. This is where the, we built the uh, MRT station of Bundaran HI. But the, the MRT station doesn't have really many connections. So when you live in the Kampung Kebun Kacang here at the backside of the uh, area, you have to walk around the area to be able to arrive to Bundaran HI uh, station. It's four, four, 540 meters. And to the uh, southern side, it is at least 275 meters that is not uh, really arriving to where you are living. So the way we build the city is not really a comprehensive way in designing and in uh, developing. By then, uh, during the pandemic, we have the uh, online uh, drivers who will uh, deliver all the goods uh, from a place to your home or to your office. But you will look at this uh, uh, development. There are 2.5 million drivers for online. And you see how packed they are, uh, full, fill up the city. You see the uh, green and uh, black jacket, yeah? they're all everywhere. 
Now the Trans Jakarta is also full. The commuter line is also full. The MRT is pretty full. This is uh, the picture that taken uh, in the uh, peak hour. And then uh, you look at the numbers of uh, 2021. The total uh, uh, vehicle in Jakarta is 21 million. It's 21 million. The reason why is one uh, family will have probably three or four cars because uh, now they have the odd and uh, even numbers of uh, uh, entering the, the, the Jalan Sudirman or Jalan Tamrin or city center, then you have to have a couple of cars to be able to be able to transport yourself. Um, also, the Jakarta's uh, government built the infrastructure for tall road and so on, but you will see private car is still prioritized. This is how we see uh, the development from the carriage to MRT in the past 1885 to 2019. And this is also an uh, interesting uh, fact that you come from the carriage to Trans Jakarta and now to the MRT. Jakarta has the obligation as other cities in the part of the world to do the uh, SDG, to do the uh, sustainable development goals. And we also have the uh, commitment to do the Paris Agreement. What Jakarta going to be for my personal uh, target is Jakarta has to be the just city. A lot of people say Jakarta after being, will be left uh, to the new capital city, we will still be the economic axis. We will learn how to consideration Jakarta to be digital based. And then the future of Jakarta has three foundation, which I will be showing you later. And also the strategic roles and issue will be showing the intensive infrastructure planning and collaborative. The foundation is making the adaptive, innovative, and synergy government of Jakarta. You will see the main contributor to national economic city welfare, good urban space, and effectiveness and efficiency mobility to be city of business center and digital ecosystem. The goal is Jakarta as center of the national economy that is sustainable, culture, and uh, with high levels of justice and prosperity. Some would like to say that uh, Jakarta has to compare themselves to New York as a big apple. We call it a big durian city, yeah? where uh, everything will be fine, uh, will be targeted, and everything will be big. Everything will be successful. This is the Jakarta with the durian city. Uh, I'll close with one of the statement of Sukarno. Uh, building a city is building a civilization. All the people of Indonesia, his soul, his heart, his spirit, his heart must rise to the sky like a national monument. For me, building a city is not building the infrastructure, it's not building a physical uh, elements in the city like buildings or uh, highways, roads and pedestrians and so on. But to me, building a city is building the people. How can we build city if it's not for people? How are we going to able to uh, provide a city where people cannot walk around, where people cannot enjoy this uh, city, where people can, doesn't have the right to go to the city, where people doesn't have uh, the uh, connectivity, people cannot walk around the city, people doesn't have the inclusiveness to go into the part, other part of the city, it will be terrible, it will be injustice, it will be a cruel situation for a city. So, but how to build that uh, situation? We need to build the people. The people got to have education, the people has to got uh, knowledge how to live in the city. If you go around Jakarta, this is a photo taken uh, on uh, Sunday when the uh, event of car free day take place. You will see a lot of people going into the city center yeah, and they walk around, they enjoy it. They do their uh, spot down there, they have their uh, communication around the area. But what happened during the weekdays, they are all cars down there. People hardly walk. Now, how to build a city, I would say, would build the people. Jakarta will be left uh, to the new city, uh, city center, uh, the new capital, but how are we going to build the city? We need to build the people. The people must be well educated the people must be well equipped to live in the city and know how to live in the city i think i'll stop here with my presentation thank you valvi yeah so i think you have bring up a very interesting and important issue here uh because if you use the, the example of jakarta uh, and you contrast it between the the colonial north and the sprawl south uh, you indirectly also say that actually this is a kind of development that we are facing since the independence 
which is very much from the colonialistic to capitalistic into a private mm -hmm. uh, centered and, and car centered city, which is not uh, sustainable because it's producing a lot of, of, of not just carbon, but also injustice and social justice issues. And then you are advocating the, the, the socialistic, more human centered, more public uh, planning oriented, which is very much uh, written to the ideal of the modernism, the early modernism is basically as a socialistic agenda. But then after the war is going into a different directions and that direction is betraying the original intent of modernism which was born in Germany that time uh, into something that is very much um, related to the to the to the capitalistic uh, players uh, and this is also related to nanda uh, first presentations and talking about the involvement of dutch japan us ussr czechoslovakia in terms of materiality and productions and even the edu edu ideology and educations this is highlighting how the the, the shift from the very socialistic ideals and utopian in the past and moving into a more, uh, say, like capitalistic and imperialistic and uh, non-human centered planning and design. Yeah, so I think uh, we can discuss this more uh, in, in, the, in the sessions, um, uh, at the end of the sessions after the sixth speaker. So I think we should move forward to the next one. Uh, the next speaker will be uh, Professor Philip Nisulwich, an executive director of Bauhaus Earth, chair of Habitat Unit at the Institute of Architecture, Technical Universität Berlin. And, and he will uh, highlight more on the issue of eco turn in constructions, about the ecology, the, the other aspect, the important aspect in, um, in the current debates on urbanism and also architecture. Uh, Philip? Yes, thank you very much. Um, I'm sharing my screen for my presentation. Uh, can you see it? Yeah. Okay. So I have to say, I really enjoyed learning um, in depth about the history and present in Indonesia. So my intervention will be somewhat of a um, kind of shift now towards uh, maybe what we could call a sort of shared concern between Germany and Indonesia, a shared concern of the present. I'm an architect but uh, and urban planner and um, academic, but a, a year ago I became the executive director of Bauhaus Earth, which is a new initiative started by a climate scientist. And we are trying to bring these kind of worlds together that don't always easily speak to each other. Um, and I wanted to introduce you to uh, some of the takes that we uh, develop and, um, and also explain why I think this is maybe relevant for a discussion and, uh, and maybe could offer some suggestions of what this network um, of um, brains from Indonesia and Germany together could, could do. So what is this shared concern? I'm, I'm talking about climate change. And of course, our Indonesian colleagues know much better what um, already existing stri climate stresses mean for Indonesia. This is this um, shot of the uh, one of the sections of the walls protecting Jakarta from rising sea level. And um, just to say that although we don't have cities nearly of the size of Jakarta and, um, and we are generally a much smaller country in Germany, but we're also facing climate stresses in form of extreme weather uh, such as this very tragic, um, deadly flood last summer or extreme droughts and heat and forest fires. So this is a concern, not just between our two countries, but of course, globally. So where do we stand? And, uh, and I'm bringing this back to the built environment because what's already known as uh, build, the built environment is absolute key to this, um, to understand the crisis, but also I would argue to understand the solutions. We know that the um, anthropogenic uh, environmental disturbance is mainly caused by the building sector. More than 40% are directly 
um, emitted by this sector, 40% of greenhouse gases, um, huge amount of waste um, is being produced. And some would argue that up to 70% of greenhouse gases are uh, emerging from cities. And the climate crisis is also a material crisis. This research has shown how last year we surpassed a very important and quite scary threshold. We have now more anthropogenic mass on Earth than biomass. And of course, this means our planet is becoming a body uh, with more than half um, of sort of artificial limbs. And this affects majorly how we can heal and uh, move forward. And the political commitments are not nearly enough. We have all watched um, the failing negotiations at the COP27, but we know this for a while that if we add all the national commitments together, this would take us to a absolutely unfeasible zone of 2.7 to 3.1 degrees, this kind of blue cloud here, um, which is threatening our civilization as we know it. And the IPCC is recognizing also the investment of the building sector in this. You see here the breakdown of greenhouse gas emissions in gray and the effect of buildings. But we see that buildings are not actually considered to be part of the solution. You know, the, um, the slogan is to decarbonize the building sector, whereas we are banking on completely unknown geoengineering uh, technologies, which uh, will further meddle with their natural systems, and they're not even invented yet and are likely to be hugely expensive and unaffordable for most. So how do we really think about buildings and cities turning from culprits in the climate space towards maybe heroes contributing to um, restoration and healing? This drawing shows a little bit where we are. We, uh, we know that forests actually 200, 350 million years ago began making life on Earth possible by sequestering atmospheric carbon and reducing global temperatures to what we know now. But, um, and, and in this kind of 350 million years, we, we have the so-called formation of the, the carbon pool of fossils in the Earth, which we have now in a very short period of time spent and blown back into the atmosphere, just 250 years. So how do we get back from that? And uh, I think the cities, uh, the way we build and the materials that we use are crucial. A major impact of this um, carbon pool depletion is due to building materials, masonry, concrete, steel, composites, the kind of materials that Mohammed introduced so um, interestingly as flowing in um, as part of the kind of Western paradigms of modernization in the 1960s, replacing hugely interesting, rich kind of local building traditions in Indonesia, which is um, for us the kind of starting point for um, a change towards the future. Going back to what humanity has always done, working with regionally available bio-based materials, and uh, not, of course, going back to assembly techniques, uh, uh, we are in the 21st century, but using all we have um, to remember how these kind of materials um, can be harvested sustainably and bring them into the 21st century. Um, and here again, I mean, the building uh, business as usual, um, sort of wood is likely to produce um, in the next 25 years, a huge um, influx of greenhouse gas emissions, 71 gigatons, if we do this with wood and other bio-based materials, we would not only avoid those emissions, but actually be able to begin to store carbon. And this is where our narrative begins at Bauhaus Earth, the kind of system change framework that I show in this drawing. Um, if we can not only, if we can think about beyond um, decarbonization of the building sector using less, uh, using less emitting um, uh, and less material, but using bio-based material, we actually have a chance to contribute significantly to climate healing. How would that work? Um, first of all, it would require a kind of broader perspective. We need to step out also as architects, planners of our own bubble and remember where materials actually come from. This requires a bioregional kind of perspective. Um, so I'm starting here on the left of the drawing 
um, where we know that the biosphere has the best capacity um, that exists uh, to sequest carbon from the atmosphere. Forests, um, um, agroforest areas, um, uh, and, uh, and of course, many kind of ecosystems have the capacity to bring carbon down from the atmosphere and store it. Now, um, how do we get this stored carbon into cities? Um, by forms of sustainable um, harvesting those kind of uh, biosphere. This is crucial because we don't want to deplete what is left. Uh, we want to use the kind of value generation that is possible at the forests um, to uh, create uh, incentives to protect and invest for um, villages, for uh, small businesses um, uh, who are largely in Indonesia and Germany alike, uh, somewhat put aside from the, the cities that control most of the economy. So how do we um, bring this kind of stored material into the building cycle in cities um, by also changing our building techniques to use elements such as wood, which are extremely efficient, um, hemp, which, are, which is extremely efficient, bamboo, which is exceeding the materials in, that are available in Europe in its density and its carbon storage capacity by many, many times, bringing them into the building cycle and keeping them there as long as possible to use them for retrofitting, upgrading, renovation, also new build, but in a way that buildings are robust and designed to keep those materials uh, for decades um, in storage. And, and this is how our slogan could come true, buildings and cities could become carbon sinks. So we have a kind of, sometimes it's referred to as 3S framework. We have sequestration at the forest side, we have substitution um, and uh, storage at the city side or let's say the built environment side, substitution of um, fossil-based materials and storage in those kind of bio-based materials. And this together adds up for us to um, a new paradigm, which we call regenerative built environment, an environment that actually actively contributes to the healing of the disturbed um, anthropocenic systems. Sustainability is no longer enough, um, the measured kind of uh, use of natural resources. We need to actually be more proactive and use building as a way to heal the climate. And this requires protecting natural carbon sinks and biodiversity by very carefully, sustainably harvesting and strengthening, strengthening those systems and, um, and harvesting in a very measured and careful way, um, bringing these kind of new building materials um, to via circular bio-based economies into cities to turn them into carbon sinks using substitution and storage potentials, but do this in a way that respects equitable outcomes and using what we know we can do in cities, integrated urban development. <clears throat> in Europe, sometimes in the uh, architecture and planning scene, we are debating should we build at all? Um, given the drama of the crisis and the seriousness of the threats that are caused through building. But taking a global perspective and, um, uh, and looking at countries like Indonesia or Sub-Saharan Africa, this is where the main um, urbanization in the next 20, 25 years will take place. So we are expecting 2.5 billion people in societies that do not feel responsible for the climate crisis, rightly so. Um, societies where we have up to a billion people living in inadequate conditions where huge demands of retrofitting in cities um, is there and, and 2.5 billion new urban dwellers are likely to be housed. So this is our challenge, our shared challenge, regardless if we live in those countries that are accelerating their uh, cities and um, built environments fast or not, we, this is our shared concern to turn this urbanization into a force of healing rather than a force of collapse. <clears throat> so do we have enough of this bio-based material? Um, it's a valid question. We have in the last 60 um, years, um, more than doubled uh, the global population, increased 60% of our wood consumption, reduced dramatically the available biosphere. And we have from multiple sectors 
um, multiple sectors invest hope in the biosphere uh, to be a force for good, and they are competing for the available resources. Of course, energy in Sub-Saharan Africa, more than 50% of wood um, crops are being, being used for, uh, for, for heating and cooking. I don't know if the figures in, in rural Indonesia, but it might be similar. Uh, we have a huge influx of needs from paper and paperboard production, packaging, bioplastics, textiles, etc. And, and now we bring construction into, into this mix too. Is there enough? And there's a kind of emerging research scene that we are also part of um, at Bauhaus Earth, and we collaborate closely with the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research to actually really understand um, is there enough biosphere that can be harvested and speak to urbanization demands in such a way that we don't destroy it? And um, I find this quote here from, from the WWF quite useful. The market for wood can motivate good forest stewardship that safeguards and expands a critical resource and protects forest values, or it can destroy the very places where wood grows. Um, some scholars are very optimistic that we have enough degraded areas to start a gigantic reforestation program in, um, in the world. Um, this is uh, a study by Jean-Francois Baston from 2019. Um, or we have a more recent study that actually from, from, Pots from the Potsdam Institute um, by Abhijit Mishra, where he looked at the available land and he considered all the kind of competing demands of food production, uh, et cetera, and, and showed that actually there is a potential for major afforestation and um, uh, that, that could generate um, and, and speak to the urbanization demand globally. And then of course, we have to consider how to overcome the conflicts between those kind of ecological concerns and social concerns in transformation to sustainability processes. These are also competing demands. We know this from, from Berlin, from German cities, the ecological construction of affordable housing is virtually impossible now. Building prices are too high, regulations are too strict. So we have a tragic kind of um, standoff between social concerns and ecological concerns. And I'm sure in Indonesia, uh, the topics would be quite, quite similar. And we have to sort of use the best knowledge and the best experience we have through integrated urban planning to create as many synergies, co-benefits as possible between, between necessary climate mitigation uh, and adaptation measures um, that we know cities need desperately. Um, and uh, we have to design them in a way that they become catalysts for just transitions, that they're pro poor, they leave no one behind, they produce better and inclusive cities. And all this is for us, again, uh, captured by this kind of paradigm of regenerative built environments for people and nature. And we know, you know, the experimentation that is going on um, around the world. Um, Asia is um, leading in many ways over Europe and experimenting with making cities, um, adapting cities to climate change, producing swamp cities, uh, rethinking about uh, water cycles and cities. The build, building material is not enough part of those kind of discussions. And this is our point. Uh, we should really think about building material as um, also part of this transformation process that we need and a catalyst for better cities for nature and people. And at Bauhaus Earth, we, we don't only do research. We also know that it is critical to actually show in practice that alternative building is possible. Uh, we recently collaborated with the um, Institute of Advanced Architecture, Catalonia and Barcelona to um, uh, create an intervention at this iconic building of modernism, the Mies Pavilion. And you see here in the middle, a different structure that is sort of um, shooting over and looking into this arrangement uh, by Mies using entirely locally or regionally available bio-based materials such as mass timber and, and we then annotated and calculated the kind of carbon that, is, uh, that was uh, uh, used producing the um, actually fake reconstructed Mies Pavilion in the 1980s um, and uh, the carbon that is 
going through this process of sequestration, avoidance, um, storage, and substitution. And um, I think we need those kind of didactic, um, explicit uh, narratives on buildings and why buildings are so important. And of course, there's huge amounts of experimentation going on globally, and there are many colleagues in Indonesia that, um, that are at the forefront of, of this. We are collaborating with the Environmental Bamboo Foundation in Indonesia, which is bringing new technology to villages in degraded forest areas to allow them to participate in the value generation around bio-based materials, um, compress bamboo to generate generic uh, building materials that could then begin to speak to 21st century middle-class urban demands. And those kind of experimentation exists globally. And I was actually really interested when Mohammed showed um, the work of um, from the 1980s from Yusuf uh, Njaya. I hope I pronounced this right. Uh, it seemed really, really interesting. This kind of experimentation was always going on. So we need to strengthen, we need to resource that, and we need to bring this kind of experimentation, which is always connecting local, regional, cultural traditions of buildings with climate change needs of the 21st century and turn those kind of experimentation into scalable, viable building economies. Um, the, and I'm soon coming to an end, uh, just a few more slides. The opportunities of bio-based materials need to be communicated. They're not just <clears throat> generating environmental benefits, uh, but also social benefits. They, they um, are able to thrive in local economies. Often in many countries, uh, cement, steel is imported. Here we have a potential to actually strengthen those kind of local economies um, in countries that were not able to thrive on the uh, carbon intensive uh, linear wasteful kind of construction model of, of modernism. Uh, we have the potential for job creation, um, skill development, um, and economic resilience, which need to be com committed and which are which are often much higher on the understandably on the local agenda uh, of cities and, and regions. And also we have to remember the the health and well-being impacts, human comfort, um, good indoor air quality, non-toxic environments, human safety and fire resistance, all these things um, actually come. Uh, for free with bio-based materials if they're used uh, in an intelligent way. And of course, cultural benefits um, because we are developing and building on local and regional traditions. So what we want to do at Bows Earth to, we want to strengthen, support, strengthen um, this emerging new practice um, with research such as global studies and, um, and uh, modeling and simulation, but also participating in supporting concrete demonstrators, proofs of concepts that we desperately need. And Indonesia has such a rich tradition uh, that is really worth bringing into this. And, um, and I think that some of this partnership, um, this partnership could be very strong and uh, also remember how we need to change our buildings and how we use our own cultural traditions and engage in a global dialogue about how to move um, on towards towards a regenerative future. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Philips. Well, it's interesting because um, when we we start uh, from from the very beginning, we remember that uh, in the past, uh, Bauhaus is starting the euphoria and carbon complacency, but now Bauhaus is initiated a new initiative by shifting the paradigm and become like ecological uh, healing and environmental, um, environmental circularity. I think this is a kind of um, very interesting turning point in terms of the, the continuity of the discourse of the, 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 the Bauhaus ideas at the very beginning on the material, uh, material sense. Uh, previously, uh, Paul, we talking about the, the social agenda and now it's about the, the environmental agenda. Yeah, and we will continue the, the discussions into the, the uh, until the end of these uh, seminars. But I think I will call the next uh, speaker, Nadia, Nadia Purwestri, the Executive Director of uh, PDA, Indonesian Center for Architecture and Documentation, or PDA. Uh, 
uh, talking about the, uh, yes, after knowing the past, how, how we can prepare for the future. Nadia? Uh, thank you, Pak Yorhanas. Um, I will uh, stop to share my screen. Yes, uh, hello everybody. Uh, my presentation today, integrating um, historical uh, information into conservation planning, is uh, about our work uh, that is concerned with the documentation and research of uh, Indonesian uh, architecture to aid conservation project. And uh, the general concern about the preservation of uh, heritage building in Indonesia. Okay, um, let me start with the introdu introduction of our institution. Our institution, uh, PDA, Pusat Dokumentasi Arsitektur, was established in 2002, but the activities to make documentation or, uh, on architectural heritage was already started in uh, 1994. One of our activities is uh, to support the conservation of a heritage building with the good documentation, because uh, the conservation process will be ineffective without an accurate documentation. So uh, we believe that uh, architecture heritage reports should be available before uh, any works of conservation started. Um, we were there because the documentation and research is always needed uh, to help uh, the conservation. If you see this image here, uh, it is an old church in Padang, West Sumatra. The church was half uh, collapsed during uh, an earthquake. When the community and the government want to restore this church, they face the difficulties because there were no technical drawings from this building. This problem occurs in many historical buildings in Indonesia, but if the records still available, it may uh, be not matched with the existing uh, condition. This is uh, because over time there are usually changes to historic buildings caused by the needs uh, of the occupants. So that even though the original technical drawings are available, they still have to be checked against the existing condition. This is what we do, consists of four steps. The first is documenting. At this stage, the activities carried out are measurement and redrawing, historical and architectural research assessment of the physical condition of building and diagnosis, as well as analysis of the survey results. The second is planning based on the result uh, of the first stage recommendation and conservation planning are made. The third stage uh, in, is implementing conservation planning. And lastly, we always try to publicize the result of our works through exhibition, writing a books, and uh, uh, trainings on the preservation. These are uh, our activities on uh, measuring and redrawing. We uh, use uh, the digital technology and also uh, manual measurement. In the documentation, sta in the documentation states, uh, research was conducted on the history of buildings uh, and architecture. This slide, this slide shows images, documents, photos, and other information related uh, to the construction process uh, of a historic building. This is an example of a document regarding uh, damage assessment along with diagnosis and uh, analysis of the cause of the damage. The, this document used uh, measurement result accompanied uh, by photographs to explain the damage in question. In the planning stage, um, we use uh, historical, sorry, in the planning states, we use historical information obtained uh, during research, among others, to determine the reference. This historic building will be restored with reference to the condition in which year. These two photos uh, describe the condition of the Yafa X, the Yafa Sabang Office Building, which is now uh, became the Museum of Bank Indonesia uh, from the 1910 and 1937. Before determining uh, in what year the condition of this building will be restored, data like this uh, is very uh, necessary. From historical uh, data we got, uh, it is known that uh, this building was built uh, in several stages. Initially, uh, since its founding in uh, 1828, the Sabang used a former hospital building, which is located within the walls of the, Batav of the Batavia city walls. Then in uh, 1910, uh, a new office 
was built, which was located uh, to the east of the former uh, hospital building. Then uh, in 1922, uh, another new building was built behind the 1910 buildings and to the southwest. Two years, later, two years later, in 1924, another building was built which uh, replaced the former hospital building on the north and west sides. Due to uh, lack of uh, uh, treasure space, in uh, 1933, a new building was added to the south of the building uh, from uh, 1910. And the last development was the uh, addition of a uh, single layer of buildings in front uh, which united the parts of the building uh, from 1910 and 1933. Based on this information, it was uh, then finally uh, decided to restore the building according to its condition uh, from uh, 1937. Uh, this is shows uh, a conservation uh, planning document we uh, usually uh, draw. This image shows the conservation of document to repair work on the outer walls uh, of the Bank Indonesia building uh, in Solo. Historical information was uh, also used to carry out uh, reconstruction planning. As seen here uh, is a reconstruction uh, of the stair relic in the main lobby in the Bank Indonesia Machine Building in Jakarta. Recon uh, reconstruction plan drawings are made by referring the old photos uh, compared to uh, the existing condition. The existing condition at that time, only the upper part of the stair railing uh, had changed, uh, while the lower part, which was shaped like a bowl made of brass, uh, was still there. I will explain how we use uh, historical information compared to existing condition in the restoration of Fort Vandenbos in Ngawi, a small town uh, in East Java. This fort was founded in uh, 1839, uh, and it had several functions before being used by the military until around the 90s. Uh, documentation and research was carried out in uh, 2018. This is the condition of the port at the time, the documentation uh, and the beginning of its uh, conservation works. The port, uh, is, uh, so the port was uh, in a very bad state condition. Almost all uh, of the roof is gone. The second floor is uh, mostly gone. The doors and windows are also mostly gone. The following uh, are uh, some old photographs. Uh, showing the condition of the fort uh, in the early 20th century. These photos are still uh, not enough actually to be used as a reference for doing conservation work. So we need another reference. Luckily, we found uh, sketches uh, made, uh, made, made by prisoners of war when the fort was used as an internment camp during the Second World War. These sketches can be grouped into several categories. Uh, here uh, we saw uh, some sketches depicting the fort's buildings. We use uh, and we use these uh, sketches as a reference in planning for the reconstruction of uh, and restoration of the fort. This aerial photo shows the condition of the fort. Last week, actually, this photo was taken last week. Uh, its conservation had almost been done, been completed. Apart from repairing and reconstructing a total of uh, about uh, 16 fort buildings, the revitalization also included uh, reconstruction of the moat uh, around the fort and excavating and integrating the old uh, drainage canal with the new drainage system. The preservation of uh, historic building uh, in Indonesia, which uh, has been ongoing, has shown several concerns. In the process of uh, implementing conservation in Indonesia, there are two schemes, uh, namely uh, top-down and bottom-up, each of which uh, has uh, its own character. Uh, in the top-down process, uh, because it is a government program, so uh, that it will have guaranteed funding, but usually it will be uh, related to the fiscal year. Although uh, it is possible to go through the fiscal year, but uh, it requires uh, a process that it's not easy and takes time. Then it is usually carried out uh, with a common project scheme and all government project must comply with rules and bureaucracy, which uh, causes uh, the project to become less flexible. As a result, the community only acts as spectators, user and connoisseurs uh, after the project ends, while bottom up 
uh, scheme is more flexible because it is not related to the bureaucratic rules. But sometimes funding become a problem. The bottom of uh, scheme also provides an opportunity to preserve local wisdom, among others, by transforming knowledge as well as guaranteeing a great sense of belonging to the community. It is often ha uh, often uh, happen that uh, top-down conservation schemes do not involve the community and are then protested by the community. Um, this has happened uh, in the small town uh, of Lassem uh, on the north coast of Java. The revitalization project of uh, the Lassem Heritage Area carried out by the Ministry of Public Works was a preservation with a top-down scheme. And what happened in Lassem? Uh, the project implementation process that was not socialized to the people who were directly affected and the lack of community involvement in decision making resulted that uh, many uh, aspirations of the people who were directly affected not being accommodated by the government. This then caused anxiety uh, in the community. The result of planning that uh, do not understand and protect the important uh, values of Lesson as a cultural heritage area have an impact on changing the character of the environment. Initially, uh, Lassam was known as one of the Chinatowns in Java, which was still intact and distinctive uh, with a strong Chinatown character. But then after the revitalization, uh, Lassam's character as a Chinatown was faded. Coupled with the carelessness of the process of carrying out the work and the absence of studies uh, on objects uh, that have the potential uh, to be designed uh, as a cultural heritage. Uh, it was a result in the destruction of uh, ancient water waterways, which is part of the Lassam heritage area. This project is then considered as uh, just uh, beautif beautification. The second is that most of the conservation uh, that is being done is just uh, beautification, ignoring the heritage values. This is an art cycle that uh, questioning uh, preservation efforts in the revitalization work of the Kota Lama Semarang area because they are considered uh, to lack uh, of historical value. Why is that? Uh, efforts to preserve uh, or revitalize urban and uh, rural areas uh, often prioritize beautification for the benefit of tourism. For example, as written uh, in this news, why is there a London style telephone booth in the Kota Lama area of Semarang. What, ha what happened then with uh, edition like this? This is because the important values of heritage area are not uh, protected. It is sure that the authenticity of this heritage area will be lost. What also often happens uh, is uh, conservation efforts solely for the sake of uh, tourism. So uh, what about the preservation of the modern buildings from the 50s and 60s? In uh, our uh, cultural heritage law, uh, it is stated that uh, buildings that are eligible to be designed as uh, monuments are at least 50 years old. This, uh, these uh, buildings that were built in the 50s and 60s before they were 50 years old, have already been demolished to make way for uh, new developments. Like uh, this one, the uh, We Party apartment uh, was already gone. Uh, the man, but uh, the money printing company complex, uh, although uh, now the money printing building and office uh, are empty, but some of these uh, official houses have been reused as place uh, to hang out. So this, uh, uh, complex uh, is uh, survive, uh, but not was uh, the case with the coin factory complex, which was located in the same uh, area as the money printing company. This complex, which consists of a coin factory, offices, and official residences for employees, has long since been demolished to make way for apartment and a hotel to be built. Even now, uh, even when these buildings are more than uh, 50 years old already, we often have to struggle to preserve them. What I explained earlier is the long journey of our institution with uh, Han Awal, a uh, German trained architect, and uh, in his professional career, then uh, choose conservation of heritage building as uh, his interest. 
it was him who had the idea to establish our institution because uh, he really understood uh, the importance of archives and documentation uh, in preservation of heritage building. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nadia. Yeah, you're highlighting a very important aspect in the, our, our discussions with this uh, conservations and also the importance of the archival because we thought archive, uh, we thought uh, could record and documentations. Uh, it's very difficult to maintain authenticity. And even now, uh, I think the potential of digital technology and also record is becoming more important if we are related to the digital twin. And digital twin is very much important for calculating the embodied carbon and how that we want to do the, the good interventions of repair and anything to consider the authenticity, but also the possibility of using the the, the bio material, for example. So it, mm -hmm. it somehow is interrelated with the previous uh, uh, presentations. But uh, also you mentioned about Pahan Awal, who, who started all this uh, highlighting the importance of conservations in Indonesia. is mm -hmm. one of the pioneers of uh, reminding us about the the, the the values of keeping authenticity and uh, the things that you also highlighted is also the the loss of the modern heritage because is not uh, captured in terms of uh, law and regulations and planning and this loss of modern heritage is also happened not just in Indonesia everywhere even Japan uh, experiencing the same things most of the buildings from the 60s and 70s is all gone Although we actually we 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 need to to have more documentation on that to under to understand the ideals concepts and so on from that era. All right, so let's move on uh, to uh, the next speaker, uh, Danny and and Ima, uh, Danny Hermawan uh, and Ima Anditya Hermawan uh, from Formologics Lab. Um, and they will talk about the experimentals, uh, the experimentations. Penny? Yeah. Okay, um, thank you very much for the introduction. And it is such an honor for us for being invited and be part of this seminar. Um, please allow us to turn off our camera to keep our bandwidth stable. Okay, next. Next. Um, Sally contacted us a few months ago and delivered an intriguing question. Um, do we need more experiments and would like to have us to present more on that topic? Um, since now we are in a small city, we are really sorry if um, later on you will might hear some uh, noisy sounds in the background, such as a uh, sound of motorcycle, crane call, or foot pedals. Uh, next. Next. So um, <clears throat> a little bit about our background. Um, we started our journey in 1999. Um, we were bachelor students at architecture um, at the Catholic University of Parahyangan, Bandung, where Professor Johannes Widodo was the director at that time. And after graduate, uh, we had a chance to be assistant at ACODECO and Urban Tectonic Research Lab in our university, which was also initiated by Prof. Johannes Widor. And next. And then um, we continued being trained as master's students in Germany in 2006 up to 2008, specifically at Dessau Institute of Architecture, the IA Hochschule Anhalt. Uh, which the campus is located very near to the iconic building of Bauhaus. Um, what we had experienced was that the IA and Bauhaus Foundation had a very strong relationship. Both directors at the time were very enthusiastic to carry out exchange of knowledge between the institutions. And for two years, uh, we were being trained in design studio under provisions of professors with many different specialties and very lucky to have them encourage um, the atmosphere of exploration and collaboration. Next. 
Okay, uh, at Formologic since 2010, we focus to incorporate computational design toolings into our design methods. And speaking about how we can contribute to sustainable architecture, we believe that uh, there are so many ways to incorporate sustainable practice in the domain of architecture, starting from ideation, production, construction, and operation process. If we see this diagram, the way we use computational design toolings doesn't change much the way we design architecture, but rather transform the way we use algorithmic power of computer through coding to explore limitless iteration of information exchange in our design workflow. With the enormous capacity of iteration that computer capital with, the computational tooling become a catalyst for design exploration. The more we do iteration, the more we can understand the consequence of our design selection that will impact the environment. So our best decision for environment can be validated during the design process, not after. <clears throat> And in order to explain uh, this a little bit more, um, we need to explain it through our involvement in some architectural projects. Next. Next. One of our milestone in implementing computational and parametric design was in March 2014, where Danny had an opportunity to design the Indonesian pavilion together with another two Indonesian architects, Ruby Rusli and Miranti Gumayana. And this pavilion was exhibited at World Expo 2015 at Milano, Italy. And in this team, um, Danny was, char was in charge to conduct a research and develop a building skin design that can accommodate um, not only uh, the main theme of Expo, but also to reintroduce a modern approach of Indonesian architecture philosophically and technologically. In accordance with sustainability concept, the pavilion is designed as semi-open facility to make the most use of natural lighting and to create fresh air environment inside the building. Modern design method, material techniques and construction such as parametric design and prefabrication are used to synergize between manufacturing technology and traditional craftsmanship, which is the rattan weaving. The computational design method was being used to explore, investigate, simulate, and evaluate the possible form and construction. Construction of the pavilion building. The, the pavilion introduced the rattle weaving that applied into generated segmented double curve panels, which were used to cover the whole pavilion building. As a response to EU uh, fire regulation, unfortunately, the building had to use synthetic rattan as the main material of the panel cladding. The modern material technology was skill skillfully handwoven through artistic traditional craftsmanship application. And, and this uh, woven clothing was actually done in Tangerang, Banten, Indonesia. And to answer this question on the challenges in the fields of craft and industry, we would like to share uh, one of our other project, Dermaga Kirana. In uh, 2016, uh, Formologics, in collaboration with uh, Carolina Junaidi, was appointed as the principal designer, which proposed a simple facility, which is docks and shelters, as a venue for tourists who are departing or arriving from River Savari at Lengang River. And uh, the project was situated in the remote area of Belitung Island, Sumatra. And directly um, in the beginning uh, of the project, we identified major challenges, which are uh, first one is a uh, harsh climate. And then the second challenges was uh, building material resources and manufacturer are really dependent to Java, the main island of Indonesia. And the third challenges was uh, difficulties of material logistic to reach our site regarding to Indonesia geographical condition. 
And this challenge is um, leading us to make a strategies such as what Danny will explain next. Since we were asked to use rotten synthetic for the very harsh climate in Belitung, we started with mathematical geometry, mathematical geometry logic to create a modular design, which can be characterized by functional partitioning into discrete scalable and reusable module. So this structure can be open to possibility to be dismantled and reassembled in other places in several several cycle of uses. However, this modular geometry eventually introduced a new topology in the terms of actor, architectural composition, design techniques, material technology, and construction engineering, which may be quite different with the common local knowledge. As, follow, as a follow-up, uh, to, to fulfill the need of construction manual, we create not a descriptive architectural construction documentation, but instead we create operative architectural construction documentation, where this documentation works as assembling guidance into assembling codes on each construction element. Maybe if you're familiar with um, Bandai kit models, maybe you will understand uh, how actually the, 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 the documentation be, become an assembling instruction. Why we choose this kind of uh, documentation? Because the conventional architectural drawing is not relevant anymore to convey information for the construction workers. Eventually, this implementation brought a synergy in um, improving local craftsmanship that developed in the community. So it can be utilized to manage and control resources more efficiently and effectively, especially for the place that are not easily accessible in the remote parts of the Indonesian archipelago. We realized the relationship between architects, builders, and the community as a local workers is also to be seen as another dynamics, where we found a new way of to accommodate uh, synergetic forms of a complex collaboration. The involvement of local residents during the construction opens up a huge possibility how our ecological message could be continued in the occupational phase. Yeah, you have to. Uh, oh, okay. Hold on. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Uh, so, in order to contribute um, to a better future, specifically in finding better materials and fabrics, we were thinking that we need to go progressive. Um, for going progressive into the future, uh, we thought that we need to start to think that the future is now. And to have a uh, knowledge on what is available around us and also a reverence from the past as well. And this is not in any way nostalgic or something. It is more maybe in the spirit of um, rebirth. And inspired by ba Bauhaus back in the days where it was looking forward, it was also looking into the past and what is around, but not literally copy paste it but explore, experiment, and critically taken into the next level. Um, so regarding uh, the challenges on finding better material, uh, up to now, we can only, um, uh, we can only uh, identify uh, several things that we think potentially to be explored. One is about database of natural materials. And then the second one is about uh, the need of a database of crafting, both handmade and machine or robo crafting. And the third is about more trial uh, and experimentation that synergizing material and crafting through technology. And for this, uh, we will need an extensive interdisciplinary collaboration. And we thought that computational design methods could contribute as a powerful catalyst for analysis, simulation, and synthesis in the process of finding better material for the future. 
So back to the first um, question, do we need more experiments? Yes, uh, we thought that we are uh, need more experiments and we are desperately waiting for the opportunity to collaborate uh, with people can experiment more in natural materials. Thank you. Uh, that's uh, the end of our presentation. Uh, back to Prof. Johannes Widon. Thank you, Ima, Ima, and 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 Danny. Well, my it's it's very impressive because uh, after you you finish your study in in Parahyangan Bandung and then you continue to go back to uh, your study in in Germany, you managed to gain uh, the original spirit of Bauhaus, which is liberal, apolitical, full of social agenda, and then you consider architecture is total work of art and do the design innovations uh, and so on. And then I think the, the impressive thing is that you managed to harvest the, the power of the, the technology, the digital technology, in order to, to help you in to do the, the iterations. So I think this is a very important uh, aspect of, of progress, that progress is not just uh, forgetting about the past and the past is not just about nostalgia, but the past is also about the spirit of innovations and 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 uh, experimentations. So I think uh, is is a very important aspect in the in the current uh, situations how we can get out from the vicious circle of of the environmental issues and social problems, and we can see that architecture still have a kind of power. Uh, for for um, uh, carrying the ideal for the future. Okay, now we come into the last uh, presenter, uh, Professor Nani Grau from Hochschule München, University of Applied Science and Hutton Palestine Architects Berlin, Germany. And uh, Professor Nani will talk about the, uh, well, the questions, answering the question, is every building just waiting for the right use? Thank you very much for the introduction. I try to start. Um, well, do you see the, well, just give me a second. Um, okay. Do you see the presentation? Uh, yes, uh, this is Irvin from Tech. Uh, yeah, we see the presentation. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> <You're welcome. laughs> Sorry for that. <laughs> Looks good. Okay, um, well, I would like to start with the following question. Is every building waiting for the right use? It was the 90s. Um, well, I brought a typical uh, picture uh, of an urban wilderness of the 19th of the 90s in Berlin, uh, which was a formative and a well, very exciting time of change, experimentation and improvisation. It was the time of the shrinking cities, many vacancies, building ruins and fellow land, which inspired and invited countless low threshold spatial experiments and cultural production that helped Berlin to invent a new identity. So through much creativity and limited resources, the found was made usable. Unique spaces have been created that could never have been imagined. And in this context, um, well, we founded uh, our office, Hütten und Paläste, huts and palaces, if you so want. And our work operates in the experiment field uh, to, generate new to generate new forms of working and co-living with diverse user groups. Uh, well, using limited resources, uh, we, uh, we develop architectural and spatial strategies that through their openness and adaptability enable long life cycles. Um, well, 90% of our projects in the last 10 years are transformations in existing buildings. And well, the question is how do we achieve architectures of openness? Um, social change leads to a constant change of the existing. What, what actually is the existing? Houses disappear, new ones emerges, imprints remain, a swimming pool becomes a place of art through the cultural practice of appropriation. A former rail line in Manhattan, the High Line was turned into a park, also a complete. Um, yeah. Uh, 
Nani, just a question. You show some different pictures or not at the moment? No. No? Because I see see your um, full screen. And sorry to interrupt you, but... Oh, then I just started... Uh, sorry, what um, should I do? This? Yes. Now we have the full screen. Sorry. Yes, now it's okay. Okay. You. So you can only see one picture. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I'm very sorry for that. I don't actually know what I did. Um, well, where we did we end? We, I think we, I just um, continue here. Well, um, well, this, I just repeat uh, what you can see here is the a former rail line in Manhattan, you, 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 you might know the High Line, which was turned into a park and um, also a completely unpredictable change of use through which the life cycle of the existing infrastructure has been extended and new inspiring places have been created. Well, many buildings carry an inherent openness within them. They have the potential to take on new uses and functions. Sometimes the time is not yet ripe until the new purposes, purpose is apparent. And their purpose is often recognized uh, by self-initiated, engaged groups of users of users and actors who on the one hand, on the one hand, urgently need spaces and on the other hand, bring strong ideas. Can buildings be open systems? In 2012, we were approached by a group in Berlin who wanted a kind of settlement which inscribed capacity to continually renew itself. Plan as a settlement that will never be finished and provides creative space for future generations of users. The Holzmark is a new construction project with an inherent Uh, with an inherent strategy for future conversion. It is a site uh, that has emerged from the Berlin club culture at the River Spray in Berlin, in which the unplanned and unfinished is part of a permanent process of creation and evolution. Its origin is a permanent informal settlement. The provisional here also stands for a way of life. Um, uh, we have developed a structure that serves as a framework for spaces of opportunity for the users. The concept of halls and huts is a large scale, robust infrastructure of prefabricated halls and access towers and corridors, which are populated with individually shaped units, the huts and constant growth and change is part of the project. Well, the architecture sees itself as a part of a dynamic system of, for changing framework conditions. And this understanding opens up different design strategies. And the application of such stra strategies, uh, the inscribed ability to, to renew, which is very strikingly visible here, uh, should always be transferred to the planning of new buildings in the future in my understanding, because every new building is already an existing building uh, right after completion. Current architectural production is increasingly created in an open dialogue. Conditions and issues change in the course of the process. They need to be iteratively, continuously coordinated with the design. Rule-based design um, uh, could be one possible answer. Since 2020, we have been planning the conversion of a former military hall as the site of uh, Buga 20 2003, that's a German garden show, on behalf of the city of Mannheim. Here, a city prefers uh, the conversion of a simple hall to a typical new build. Examples for this approach can be found in countless alternative self-initiated and temporary projects, for example, like the Holzmarkt. Um, well, this is an example of how to deal with variables in the planning process on a, an existing structure. At the time of the competition, uh, the issues were only partially determined. Uh, structural assessments uh, were not um, available. The fascination of the hall lies in the possibilities offered by the almost endlessly structural grid. It can be an anchor for future uses. From the outside, however, it initially appears soberly, sobering, well, only like a, a long flat barn. This is where our, our design comes in. The specified spatial program is implemented non-hierarchically over the entire hall. Uh, the building envelope is opened in an alternating sequence of open and closed sections. And the result is a set of thematically determined interior and exterior spaces 
um, well, this achieves a breakup of the monotonous large scale from uh, form into scaled and diverse spatial context. And the climate ecological specifications are made possible by the implementation of several fresh air corridors. Uh, the, the, the design or it sees itself as a playable keyboard of existing substance and diverse new uses indoor and outdoor. While the large form is fragmented, a new facade, facade emerges from the structure. Bas uh, basically, the design is a kind of pure dismantling. Um, well, this is the design, architectural principles and rules form the tools for adjustments in the further planning process. Uh, the main thing is actually the concept can be applied to changing sizes of the halls in the process. It is process stable. This floor plan shows uh, the competition layout, um, which has changed a lot since then. We started on the top left and ended on the, uh, uh, on the, on the right uh, to the bottom. Um, over a period of six months, variations were explored and calculated with the clients and optimized according to the client's criteria. In phase one, the hall will be used for, for, the, for the garden show, then in phase two as the center of a city district. In the distant future, uh, reconstruction or further deconstruction is also conceivable. We perceive uh, the hall in constant evolution, which guides our in intervention and understanding of it. And, and th this is a different way of thinking. While well, using a prototype, uh, the dismantling was tested in order to plan for unpredictability. It's, it's a kind of important and sensible measure when dealing with existing building. This open hall section can later be combined with other closed and open areas to create a neighborhood-like uh, composition with new visual relationships. Diverse uh, existing vistas and spatial experiences are created. Um, well, this shows uh, the hall after the completion, after the completed dismantling. Um, complete, completion is scheduled for next year, April. Space, space production is never solely a structural experiment, but also a social one. The question that always arises is how do we want to work and live together? In order to find and test answers to this, we can use real world ex projects as laboratories for experimentation, such as the Holz Markt. One other example of such a laboratory is uh, the Predico Farm. It's a heritage protected farmstead in Brandenburg, a, a, a future place for communal living and contemporary work in the country for uh, in the future 100 people. The project is about a life connected to the landscape um, while the listed site, which was on the verge of decay, was safe, uh, safe thanks to the cooperative organization and the commitment of the residents. This is the place to live and work. Um, the development is planned successively over a long period of time. Users have been developed in such a way that only a few interventions, um, where well, you can see them in red, are required. The users follow, it, follow the existing structure. Each building is structurally designed so that several uses are possible in the long term. Also openness is, uh, is included. The starting point of this development is the village barn, which you can see right here. It serves as a form of social infrastructure for the resettlement of the farmstead and for the residents uh, to grow together. It, it was planned jointly by old and new Predico residents. It's a small village uh, and has been used by all Predico residents ever since. The project also has a political dimension because different life plans are being negotiated between city, country and East West Germans. It was a former place for animals, then for trucks. Um, now the village barn is a synergetic place with a high density and mix of uses, which uh, is a kind of microcosm of the entire future farmstead. It is a, simultaneously an event and seminar area, co-working, restaurant, village, living room and workshop. The uses can be interconnected and overlap. Well, it's an architecture that addresses possible synergies between users. Um, very many combinations of use are possible with an openness of appropriation. 
Simple construction methods equal simple crafting techniques. It is easier for laypersons to get involved in existing buildings than in highly specialized new builds. As a result, care processes are established and uses developing a connection and identity with the buildings. This is the this picture shows the group cleaning and removing mortar from the bricks. Um, um, yeah, building with existing structures um, also means accepting um, the fragmentary. It's an update rather than a return to any original historical condition. See the cab window uh, to the right uh, in the facade, uh, um, which is from GDR times and which we kept. Um, <clears throat> The rooms that can be switched on at the sides are behind translucent walls that serve to provide cross lighting and at the same time allow uh, the simultaneous uses taking place to be visible. So proximity is created. Um, um, so what is the architecture that emerges in this context? Um, here, a spatial layering and superimposition or collage of the existing wooden structure and simple and new simple industrial material is created. Old and new uh, interweave. Uh, this allows new identity creating narratives to be developed. Mm. Um, if we work predominantly in existing buildings in the future, we must fundamentally come to terms with our aesthetic ideas of architecture. Architecturally, this is about recognizing the fragmentary. This is a workshop space and kitchen box. New window at the entrance um, of the farm during the day um, um, and at night um, towards the village. Um, well, Hof Prediko, but also the Holzmarkt in the future as well, the U-Hall are developing into a network of interlocking systems with a lot of openness for long-term developments. Um, they connect the past with the future, reduce resource consumption, and by means of appropriate architectural strategies can achieve more complexity in their use uh, to become diverse and long-lasting. Uh, demolition is short-sighted. Uh, uses for semi-robust buildings are being found. I'm sure about this. Um, to us, it seems to make sense to understand buildings more in their changeability, like in this picture by Fishley and uh, Weiss, which I like a lot, which shows beca the becoming and decaying. To understand buildings more like a garden could be an interesting model of thinking. Um, buildings are habitats, organisms, networks of relationships, and cycles. Um, well, and our building inventory has grown to a gigantic uh, resource library with countless stored values. It's an inspiring starting point for a sustainable transformation. And the finiteness of our resources requires the transformation of our existing buildings while preserving as much as possible. Well, transformation with maximum con conservation. Yeah, um, um, and, and therefore more incentives um, for preserving buildings and reusing resources must be created. Must be created. Well, as already Emma and Philip have has, have mentioned, we need more experiments, laboratories uh, to find uh, scalable solutions. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, uh, uh, Nani, for a very. Uh, uh, interesting examples and, and propositions on adaptive reuse and the development of the, the way of looking into the so-called the new lifestyle and how we, we appreciate the past, but at the same time also uh, thinking about the possibility of rejuvenation, regenerations, without necessarily uh, forgetting about the past. Now, um, we have come to the end of the six uh, a very interesting speaker. If my, if I may just um, uh, recall a bit about the, the uh, just uh, from the first speaker, um, uh, Nanda uh, start with uh, talking about the 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 examples of materiality uh, at the beginning of the sixties, seventies, uh, that the, the ideals of modernisms and 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 Bauhaus and all that thing and carried forward by the architects who had just graduated from Germany, from Europe, back to Indonesia, um, that create, uh, not just in Indonesia, but everywhere, is um, about uh, what I said, I, I, I label as a carbon complacency. <laughs> we are complacent. We, we think that resources is unlimited. Therefore, um, we can 
achieve whatever we want using especially uh, the carbon uh, uh, intensive materials like steel and concrete. Yeah, and then uh, uh, Alvi continue with, to, to highlight about the, the, the urban crisis, the human misery uh, with the high, very high carbon emissions uh, created by the, the paradigm of the cars is not the paradigm of human, then the loss of the social uh, concerns of, of the modernist ideal. So these two first speakers uh, give us a very good uh, perspectives on how we now we can learn from the past mistakes, uh, the past mistake of the our generations um, about the different uh, about the, the design paradigm and also our implementations in our architecture and urbanisms. But then. Uh, Philip uh, give a very interesting uh, uh, highlight also on the paradigm shift. Now it's about time to, to heal the planet and uh, focusing on the environmental circularity, uh, rethinking about the new materials, wood, bamboo, biomaterials, uh, recreating or rejuvenating the sink or the pool of the carbon into the earth capturing back the carbon and then recycle it. And Nadia is, um, is again highlighting the importance of conservations through uh, documentation, information, uh, in order to, to, to achieve a certain level of, of, of authenticity that um, yes, is important to, to progress, but at the same time also don't forget about the past. Yeah, and Danny and Ima um, shows the alternatives of doing things. As something that is, for me, is kind of revival of the original spirit of the Bauhaus and the modernist uh, that uh, started in the even uh, 20s or 30s. Uh, talking about the, the spirit of experimentation, finding something new, new frontier. And now we have digital technology. We have the power of computing to do the, the iterations of whatever form and doesn't need to say, um, go straight away into using the real material of steel or concrete. And it's a, it's, this is a very big opportunity actually to, to, to uh, not just simulating the form, but also talking about carbon. How much is the embodied carbon that actually has been um, preserved? Uh, and this can be part of the so-called the, the, the BIM or, uh, the digital twin, the console uh, potential as part of the parametric uh, design iterations that can be produced. And finally, Nani shows the real implementations of these ideas, of these iterations by suggesting that, that we go back to the open building system and consider um, architecture, the existing architecture as a grid, as a framework to accommodate your future iterations of usage, future iterations of functionality by keeping the extending the age, the construction age of the material that has been there, the embodied carbon. And then the new iteration should not create a big carbon footprint, but instead by changing the mindset, changing the lifestyle, we will be able to rejuvenate the city, rejuvenate architecture, rejuvenate our life um, with a new lifestyle that is more organic, that is more friendly towards nature and, and environment. So I think the, this interesting uh, uh, discussions, if we link together uh, and goes back to the original theme of this, uh, this afternoon, uh, uh, conversations between past and future. There's a new forms of design, construction, and material cultures. I think the six speakers uh, pointed towards uh, the right directions. But before we can um, continue the the you know uh, the next stage of of, of discussions, I think maybe it's good to, to some questions from the audience. 
So any audience, uh, you feel free to type your questions in the chat or you can raise your hand and then you can direct uh, your questions to any of the speakers to the all, 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 the all speakers. So who will start? Is there anyone who want to kickstart the conversations? Yes. I know it's, uh, yeah, it's two hours, uh, almost three hours, <laughs> two hours and a half. Yeah? It's very, uh, it's like marathon, but, but I think the topic itself is very uh, relevant and, and yeah. interesting. Uh, Moritz. May I start? <clears throat> yes, please. I mean, it's, it, it's, it's really a, a, a huge amount of topics. Um, um, and I think there are many <clears throat> links between the, um, between the con contributions. Um, so, I, so it's hard to choose something uh, <laughs> from, from the many questions um, 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 I have, but I want to start with linking um, 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 Philip um, to morphology, uh, to formal logics. Um, so because uh, what Philip pointed out is that um, uh, that era, that there are um, following these um, uh, studies um, already made, that there are um, um, that, there's, that there's enough wood or let's say um, um, natural material to to, uh, to well to build our future, and um, um, from the side of formal logics, um, I remember they ask for some kind of database for natural materials. Um, and um, what I remember that things like this um, for used materials already exist in Germany. There's a company that is called Concular, um, um, who is um, 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 <clears throat> collecting and uh, used materials and putting them in a, in a database so that uh, um, um, architects or private people can um, can um, uh, uh, purchase them there. But will there be um, more more databases and things like this um, with resources available in a uh, more global or well, let's say for Indonesia um, or on, on a local level um, um, is something in the making, something like this in the making? Okay, um, we, we, do you want to answer? Okay, um, at the moment, I think this is also kind of challenge for us because we don't have at that kind of database. Mm -hmm. Even the standardized uh, building um, building materials is also really hard to find here. So um, um, it is. I think it is important if we can develop or we, we can establish that kind of database and put it uh, uh, into a material bank database. So uh, that kind of data should be embedded into, for example, a B BIM objects. I think it will be really, really helpful for, for designers. So any kind, I mean, because uh, now almost everything can be count uh, through computational technique, right? I mean, hardware, software is now are, are now really really capable to do uh, uh, precision modeling. So it, it is really it is really a shame if if we if we forgetting that kind of um, possibility because through um, any kind of design starting from now. Uh, all the consequence, all the consequences can be can be pulled in the design process, not after the design process. Mm -hmm. So, so for example, if we think about the um, sustainability, sustainability practice, I think it is better to 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 explore it during the design, not not after the design finish, right? So, um, I think that's my answer. Yes, uh, I would like to add some answer that. Um, <clears throat> There is a consideration that in order to keep the material footprint uh, material footprint low, so uh, 
we need to focus on local materials that located, for example, not more than a thousand kilometers from where we are. So um, in Indonesia itself now, uh, what become a common public or common knowledge here, natural materials is either bamboo or wood. But uh, we see that actually if we, um, uh, we had a research or um, exploring our um, environment here, probably we can take a look at the earth itself as a, a basic material. And also in Indonesia, we had actually a lot of fiber uh, came out from agricultural waste that maybe it has potentially uh, potentially developed uh, to be a new material in the future. I think, uh, yeah. Yeah, Moritz, is it? Yeah. Any follow-up questions? Or Philip? Yeah, I'd like to ask Philip uh, to, 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 to add a bit on this. A uh, topic of um, <clears throat> of available resources um, because what what we always hear from our European or German perspective is this um, um, this idea that if we now shift to wooden constructions, uh, for example. Um, there will be no wood anymore um, available uh, soon, and it will, and, and that is what is already happening. That wood is extremely becoming ex extremely expensive as a construction mater material, and um, so what's what's the situation with this? Uh, where does this material come from? Is there a database or is there a growing database to um, to uh, for available materials, or how are these problems handled besides um, the people who deal with these materials, or beyond um, the people yeah, yeah. Who deal with these materials? Um, no, it's a very important question. I mean, material database is kind of one tool, but there, in order to really come from the experiment to scale, uh, which is the challenge. You know, we have to overcome many barriers. I mean, knowledge about material and how it performs, et cetera, is one part, but I mean, there are really tough regulatory barriers, legislative barriers that need to be overcome that are often uh, really the outcomes also of decades of lobbying of certain kind of uh, groups behind certain materials. Um, and um, so, you know, and also to make, to make it sort of palatable actually to users um, who, I mean, often in Germany and possibly also in Indonesia, but I, I wouldn't be able to tell for sure, um, working with bio-based materials is a kind of um, somehow caught between an elitist practice that very innovative architects uh, like uh, Formologics, whose work I really like, and we already chatted um, in this webinar, uh, and, and also it's associated with poverty. So, um, to bring it to scale is really to bring it to, in a sense, a kind of middle-class consumer base. Um, so it needs to be able to fold into um, production of housing or uh, workspaces. You know, really it needs to be used at scale um, in and fold into the kind of um, uh, scalable kind of industries. Oh. And and that's, I think, the the hard work we have to do. There's experimentation going on everywhere. And it's necessary and important, but we have to kind of think beyond a kind of isolated, small, situa situative uh, experiment and really sort of see how we can use digitalization, prefabrication, um, uh, kind of equitable kind of uh, production cycles in order to bring to bring this material to bigger uh, uh, users and and implementers. I mean, and this is not easy because I mean in Berlin. You know, the housing associations, the public housing associations that have huge political pressure to build more affordable housing in the city uh, remain on the fence because they say, you know, you choose, you know, ecological or social. Um, I mean, I'm simplifying an argument here, but, but you know, often it comes down to that. So how do we break through that 
uh, is important. And, and we have to, in terms of material availability and the soaring prices of bio-based materials, I think we have to be arguing less ideologically, um, but more fact-based and kind of science-based. If you really look what triggers the explosion of building markets, it's a, a building materials, it's not lack of availability. Um, it's actually a, a, a screwed up uh, and disrupted kind of global supply chain. Also the timber around Berlin, it's not really flowing into the local building cycle, but it's actually being exported to Canada, to Australia, uh, uh, all over the world um, because of, I think, a consequence of also problematic economic policy that has really privileged large global actors um, to um, produce uh, for a global market. And we need to sort of very carefully and again, not ideologically, but kind of fact and science-based um, find ways mm. of kind of bringing this down to more regional uh, metabolism and flows. I think that's really crucial. And, and of course, we, we often face um, criticism uh, when we say, okay, we have to build. There are, in a sense, fundamentalists who, with many good arguments, say we have to completely stop building or let's better continue building in concrete. Uh, let's not uh, fell a single tree. But I think this is making, uh, seeking simple answers. I mean, we simply, we have to change our practice and we have to find ways of actually bringing, uh, really thinking this economy, uh, economic argument uh, to the end. Um, no one who owns a forest at the moment in, in Germany can really pay for the necessary um, restructuring that is required in order to make the forest fit for climate pressures. Berlin has, uh, in the vicinity, experienced, I think, almost 400 forest fires in the last summer when there was drought and heat um, because we have plantation pine um, because of a local history and wartime destruction and reparation, all this kind of stuff. Indonesia has uh, palm oil and coconut pine. We have, we have made our biosphere extremely fragile in terms of biodiversity, also in terms of its resilience towards climate pressure. So we need to change it. We need to intervene. I'm, I'm afraid, and I'm not talking about primordial forests, of which, of course, there are many in Indonesia. And I was very excited to see Indonesia teaming up with Brazil at the COP27 um, and, and really sort of creating global partnerships for the protection of these primordial forests. I'm talking about degraded land, uh, plantations, uh, and, um, and all these... Um, Potential, potentially be available land for afforestation and better forest management that that can produce um, uh, the building material. And all these studies that I cited have actually not focused on biodiversity hotspots or primordial forests. Sorry, that was a bit long. I stopped. Yeah, thank you, Philip. I, I just want to, to continue this because it's quite interesting because uh, Ima and Danny start with uh, the database, the need of database. And then uh, uh, Nadia has been started with this, all this uh, documentation and information things. And uh, uh, Nanda uh, also gives some information about the, the old materials, uh, existing material like cement, steels from the history. Whether it's possible actually to produce a database when we record the buildings like, like Nadia did in BDA, it also includes the materiality, material of the past like concrete, steel, glass, and so on, plus new materials or even organic materials as part of the, of the information system. So the architects like uh, Ima and Dani and also uh, Nani, uh, we're able to use that to create uh, net waste or zero waste buildings uh, and conservations, not just net zero energy, but also net zero waste. Whether this is possible, uh, Nadia. Hey, uh, thank you, but Johannes. Uh, I think uh, that will be possible because uh, when we uh, finish uh, with the uh, restoration of uh, one uh, heritage building, we always uh, made a list of uh, materials uh, that we use and also uh, the suppliers. Uh, where we get uh, that material uh, uh, from. Because 
uh, after uh, the restoration, uh, it is uh, kind of uh, mandatory for us to uh, uh, make a, a kind of the uh, guideline for maintenance, uh, and that's why we uh, we always uh, made uh, that kind uh, uh, list of uh, material uh, that we use. So if uh, we want to uh, turn that uh, list of, of materials uh, into the database, we can, uh, I think uh, we can uh, use uh, that uh, information from uh, all of uh, the uh, building that uh, we uh, already uh, restored. Yeah, thank you. So I think this is also linked to the, the dream of Pa'awi because on the database itself, it can all, not just the tangible informations, but also the intangible uh, informations about the possibility of, of the, the recycling of the, even the use of the buildings, uh, rejuvenation to make it more, say, um, a community base, more embracing and so on. So do you think Pa'awi and you benefited from this uh, uh, upgraded database uh, if it's available through the BDA. I think you're still muted, sorry. Sorry. In fact, I've been in contact with uh, uh, Ibu Nadia for uh, getting some of information, some data from her. Uh, what make things more difficult uh, to do my research is also because of the data. Yeah? We do not have a lot of data here in Jakarta uh, to support my research. For example, uh, the Hotel Indonesia itself has been a beautiful building, an important building that been built for the Asian Games expansion by pa, the, the, the Muhammad. Uh, then nowadays, uh, Hotel Indonesia has been seen as a Kempinski hotel not as a hotel in Indonesia, which has the value of heritage. Now, to dig out more of this uh, uh, project, yeah, we would like to do some uh, exhibition with Hotel Indonesia to expose and to explore it and to also uh, giving the uh, knowledge, information to the Jakartans and also other people around Indonesia to know what J uh, Hotel Indonesia is all about but we have not so much data yet to be collected and to be able to curate them, to uh, do it as an exhibition. Uh, having said that, uh, if we look also at the area of this uh, Hotel Indonesia surrounding, you will see that the tra traffic uh, management or the traffic planning or the infrastructure planning here is very poor, very weak, then you don't have to go to other places uh, of Indonesia to, or in the remote area to see how messy the city is, how poor uh, the city is, how uh, bad managed the city is. You just go to the center of Jakarta, the heart of Jakarta. Yeah, just uh, a step, uh, not even 100 meters, a step from uh, these two super blocks, Plaza Indonesia and Grand Indonesia, where you have the Kempinski Hotel, the Grand Hard Hotel, you will immediately see how messy we are, we have planned our city, how messy that we did not have a consideration to build a place for people, to build a place for in, our inhabitants. We don't, we just build the place uh, for economical uh, target. We just want to have our growth in economical issue. We just want to see buildings uh, one to the other, but we hardly looking at the well-being of the people. We don't even look at the justice of the people. We don't look at the just city that I was uh, actually targeting to Jakarta and all other cities in Indonesia. We are very poor in that because I would say we do not have a lot of uh, data to support us to uh, then back us up to say that this is what we have done. This is what has been uh, developed and this is what we have wrongly uh, uh, developed. For example, uh, if I may have a bit uh, uh, time more. Now in front of Hotel Indonesia, there is a monument, a welcome monument to Muslamat Datang. Yeah? And what happened is, this, I mean, in most of the country or uh, cities, you will respect a monument from a distance. You hardly can build something to distract your view to this monument. But if you come from the north part of the uh, uh, 
the area, the Jalan Tamrin towards this monument or from the north for the southern part towards this monument, it is now covered by two stories uh, uh, station for the LRT, two storage. Yeah. And it's covered, it's distract your view, not being able to see this monument. And we allow that. Mm. I mean, this is mm. this is something that uh, currently okay. we are fighting mm. in Jakarta with fellow architects to see mm. what is the uh, value of a heritage uh, monument, what is the value of the heritage uh, architecture that we do not respect at all. Because what? Mm. Because we also didn't have a lot of data to be uh, present, to be curated for the people to be able to learn what is all about uh, the, uh, what you call the monument, the heritage buildings and the heritage uh, aspect here in Indonesia. I think that's my, my problem, my answer. Thank you. Okay, so I, I just imagine that the, well, Hotel Indonesia and there is some similarities also with positions like the House of Statistics in Berlin. It's right at the city center. It's almost the same scale. Uh, mm -hmm. But um, and also the question is to Berlin, what are you going to do with that after the, the community able to secure that and it's not demolished? Yes, it's a great thing that you manage to save the, the uh, huge embodied carbon of that building. So uh, next thing is how you know, to inverse this understanding of, of, of use, what is uh, the future means for these kind of buildings. And you mentioned about the heritage, right? The, the terms of modern heritage. And both are heritage, yeah. And also uh, the, the, the case that uh, uh, Nani is used is also about heritage. So how this terms heritage means in these three different cases. Uh, Hotel Indonesia already mentioned by Pak Alwi that is considered as part of the Indonesian history because of this war reparations money and the beginning of modernization on Jakarta. And there is a, a, a monument uh, similar scale in, in Berlin, but also um, uh, say like the, the, the old buildings, the, the factories or the industrial heritage that um, are being uh, say reused again with a completely a different uh, you know, appearance. So I think this is two uh, interesting uh, examples between the, the, the examples that Pro, uh, proposed by uh, Nani, and also I think is what happened in the central Berlin. So maybe you can uh, uh, Sally or, or Nani, give some comments on this. Nani? Yes. Would, uh, would you say something? Okay. Well, yeah, for us, the heritage, um, well, as I already said, said is a chance uh, to connect the past with the future on one hand. On the other hand, we see uh, this also as a resource and quite pragmatically and uh, use what we can use and don't use what we can't use uh, um, for, the, uh, for, uh, for, for, the, for the future. Um, well, <laughs> what, what, well, please, what, what else would you... Want no, to... because I'm interested uh, also to to uh, 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 Nanda because not all heritage actually has uh, positive connotations. For example, uh, it's related also to to debt, mm -hmm. to uh, foreign foreign influence. For example, like Hotel Indonesia with the war reparations money with the Japanese occupation as well. So how to deal with all this uh, memory of the past? That is not just about physical, but also about the, the ideological meanings. Well, I'm not the expert on this. <laughs> <laughs> no, maybe Nanda can explain a bit. Well, I don't. I, well, let, let me take an example. As example, all these buildings are uh, built during the Soekarno era, Hotel Indonesia included. Now, uh, in Indonesia at least, we've been seeing those buildings as a representation of. Um, I don't know, the spirit or image of a newly independent nation and all that. There is something heroic about those buildings. I, I, I don't mean to dismiss that. Fine. I take that. Nevertheless, it, when I look at those archives from the state secretariat archives, uh, because the state secretariat was the government body who supervised the construction of all these buildings, then 
I noticed that, well, there are a lot of interests um, beyond uh, beyond the uh, nation building of, of the new nation. I'm talking about economic and political interests of various actors, whether they're foreign, whether they're, whether in the context of the Gold War, it is the interest of uh, the Western blocs as well as the Eastern blocs, the Soviet Union in particular. I mean, look, uh, remember that when Sukarno asked Khrushchev to help, to give help for the sports venue uh, project, initially Khrushchev was very reluctant because what's the use? If you want help for industrialization, I'll help, but this just a vanity. Uh, that, that, that is something that Khrushchev wrote in his memoir, by the way. But then eventually Khrushchev started to realize, you know, actually we want to influence Indonesian foreign policy. We want to get access to Indonesian natural resources and well, maybe some access from sea routes for its submarines, perhaps. <laughs> so why not? 12.5 million US dollars will be fine for the sports venue. That's for, from the Soviet Union side. Uh, whereas uh, the, the six man plan, which supplies all uh, Portland cement to all of these buildings, uh, implied American in, uh, interest there. Whether it is the influence of uh, the interest of the U.S. government to keep, you know, make sure that oh, Indonesia don't be a communist country, please, uh, as well as the interest of U.S. Uh, companies such as the Morrison Knudsen International. By the way, Morrison Knudsen International, along with Bechtel International, are two big contractor corporations in the U.S. with interesting roles during the Cold War, uh, with projects all around the world, using American money, of course, uh, including projects in Indonesia. And the cement, uh, the Grisic cement plant was the entry point for the Morrison Knudsen to Indonesia before it got for their contracts in Indonesia, well, with American money as well. Um, so all, the, all, all of the buildings were um, supplied with Portland cement from that very basic cement plant. So, so implied. So, so, so without you know, I, I mean, I mean, you're right, uh, uh, you honest. Um, there is, it's, it's not always positive when it comes to the connotation of this building. So, but, but that is, but then that's okay. I mean. The interesting thing about these heritage buildings is that they are a sort of books, right? Um, uh, regarding history, I, I think a Professor uh, Nani talked about it, mentioned it. Um, it. It doesn't matter whether whether um, there is both positive and negative uh, connotation of it. it but, that, but that's history. You know, uh, for an analogy, uh, for the last 15 years, if I'm not oh, 20 years, I don't, I don't really know. Uh, some scholars in various disciplines who studied the Cold War era, they have come to realize that, you know, the Cold War was not that clear cut. It wasn't really, you know, su such as the Soviet Union, anytime the Soviet provided financial aid to any country, they never gave rubles. They always gave US dollars. No, no why is that? See, it's not clear cut. So I, th I think that's the importance of uh, heritage buildings as a book containing both positive and negative um, um, connotations. So I think the lesson is really the materiality is not value free. But yeah. then if you want to deal the more and moving forward, then we should use the spirit of pragmatism. Exactly. As uh, Nani said, right? And, and rationality. And based on yeah. this uh, modern exactly. spirit, so we can move forward easily now to yep. address the contemporary issues that is more pressing. May I add something um, concerning yes, the House of, House of Statistics? Um, I just had an interesting talk yesterday with Manfred Kühne. You invited him to, to your Singapore conference uh, last year. So um, he's responsible for, for the development of this house from the side of the Senate. And he's he really regrets a lot of things. Um, I think um, the House of Statistics is saved, but um, his dream would be that we rebuild it one way after the other, like Nani is working. And uh, we had this property management of, of the um, municipality and they um, 
we moved everything from the inside and the outside. Now we have a skeleton there for a time and then they rebuild it again. And I think the future should be to think about um, how we can um, not remove everything first and then bring it back, but to work on this this uh, with the things inside. And um, this is this is a long way to go to this to go this step yeah because um we have one one good step but the next one should be to think about the building completely different because everything was there yeah and now it's away and yeah you should start again mm. yeah but at least you have frames now and then that frames is ready to be filled with the new things it's become like new breeding ground, like a uh, rice field. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> but, but part, partly that is that is actually happening, but partly we are also reconstructing a concrete facade uh, for part of the building, which uh, in the light of the discussion we are having is exactly what Sally is referring to. It's not appropriate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, Moritz. May I add something? Um, <clears throat> Um, um, that connects um, uh, Mohammed, Philip, uh, Nani, well, and, and also Nadia. Um, Philip mentioned um, that uh, the use of natural material is sometimes or largely um, um, associated with, with uh, as, as a poor material uh, um, in, in its understanding. Um, so, and um, uh, I think. Uh, on another level, um, uh, well, that's something completely different. But um, with uh, um, so, uh, what I learned from Johannes from a, that was super interesting uh, um, um, a lecture he gave um, years ago for the um, Getty Center, um, where he explained uh, the connection of. Um, or the difficulties in preserving colonial buildings because they always embody this colonial past um, of, of, of the country. So, and um, another issue is that as far as I remember, it was, was it in, 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 in Indonesia that the Dutch abandoned bamboo because they um, considered as, as a source of um, of um, uh, um, dangers for, uh, for danger for health um, because it's hollow and all the insects are inside and everything bad is inside bamboo. So they changed the uh, they forbid bamboo, um, and that went hand in hand with um, what what Muhammad said. Um, so the, the the construction industry was taken over by new materials from abroad. Um, so. And I think, and, and another example is to extend this topic a bit, uh, I hope not, I will not confuse it uh, more than I already did, is um, how we deal with, um, <clears throat> with the built heritage of the German Democratic Republic. Um, and um, um, a, lot of a lot of exciting buildings of the German Republic, German Democratic Republic of East Germany were demolished. Um, because they somehow symbolize this system uh, that um, we don't want to see anymore. Uh, we don't want to see the symbols anymore. So there are, I think, several layers in the use of material, in the use of um, existing buildings that have to be considered besides um, pragmatism as, um, as, as, um, um, as a kind of uh, guiding principle so that we have the material and the material is simply the material and nothing else. And then there is another thing that uh, um, I'd like to connect to, um, to, um, to, to Nani, um, that following this, we, we need a completely different aesthetics um, um, uh, when, when, uh, when, when using different materials in a different context, in a new context, we have to get rid of these expectations that we uh, um, connect with modern architecture or with, um, with, uh, uh, with wealth and with all these things um, that, um, <clears throat> that don't help us to, 
to 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 move this step in a in a to a sustainable future and i'm um, excited what philip said that um he, he does not all only want to um be on a let's say plus or, or on, a, on a neutral level um so he has the ambitions or uh to al already compensate um um, um uh, the mistakes of the past um, through bringing in positive impact uh, through these nat natural materials. Um, so that's super interesting. You know. And for me, it's interesting how these things from, from Mohammed's uh, ideas to, uh, to Nani's ideas um, and to the questions of um, formologics um, uh, how somehow are uh, connected. Yeah. Okay, sorry. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Moritz. You, you help to connect everything, so <laughs> make my job easier. Is there any other questions? <clears throat> or comments? I mean, just just referring to the latest chat entry, um, yeah. which is kind of continuing also um, something I put in the chat earlier that that I think we can all get very excited about standards and digitalization and BIM, but we have to also really remember um, that the majority of urban production is is sort of not very easily uh, kind of compatible to planning approaches, which are very cost intensive, very labor intensive, uh, very sophisticated. Um, I mean, they are not arguing against it, but we have to really sort of take this further and actually acknowledge that we that there can't be technical fixes we need we need to have a multiple tool set to bring society behind this project and in certain contexts like in rural areas smaller cities and you know with all the vernacular ongoing uh, building production you know we need we can't just insist that everybody uses bim uh, that would be future so we need to um, really cleverly communicate the benefits of uh, working, uh, of, of building in a more robust, future-oriented um, way, using better materials, um, being less wasteful, et cetera. So yeah, that was, I just wanted to pick that up from the chat, which I thought was really important. Mm. Yes. May I add, add something again? Uh, yes, Sally. <laughs> Um, there is an initiative, initiative of our uh, German architecture chamber president, Mrs. Gebhardt, um, um, addressing our, our um, regulation, uh, German regulations, that uh, at the moment we are, for, uh, architects are forced to use uh, the newest technology when they are planning a building and to uh, skip this this regulations on um, make it more flexible for for people to decide for themselves which technological standard they want in the buildings and this if our architect chamber uh, forces this i think this is really a great development and i hope they are they are um successful um, because these over regulated um building uh, technologies what philip already mentioned is um is is um it's a problem for people who think very progressive and um pragmatic yeah <laughs> to use this yeah. world again thank you sally now it's um well it's almost uh lunchtime in berlin dinner time in indonesia mm -hmm. and supper time in singapore <laughs> but uh, i think before we we close this very interesting very open-ended. I think um, uh, uh, I will ask uh, each of you one by one just to give a final statement. It's just a very short one. One minute. Maybe start from Nani. Um, oh, I'm very sorry. I'm very sorry. <laughs> I, just read, I just read an email which was coming. <laughs> sorry, it's okay. Listen. Oh, my God. <laughs> Could you from, from Nanda. From Nanda. <laughs> I'll just take you, you what take what say. you take from these discussions. Well, 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 it's interesting. Um, I I, I agree with uh, Maurice that um, there is a red line uh, between all all of us to present uh, from you know learning from the past mistakes and not only the mistakes uh, but also the good things about it as well will be 
beneficial and looking forward really um, i think that's that's important that's that's yeah. it yeah thank you nanda balwi i would say uh, this is very important to have such discussion yeah that we see a lot of things from different perspective and uh, i would say if we can do it more often that we can also uh, learn from each other more and we could also do more better design for our uh, society and we can do uh, more better uh, result of our architecture and also city planning for the people yeah i would say uh, great uh, gathering today thank you yeah thank you thank you uh, philip yeah i also really enjoyed thinking through things across two very different contexts um germany and indonesia and we discover a lot of commonalities and i think we discover that we are really bound by so many growing common concerns um that we need to really put all brains together and and learn across uh, you know and adapt and replicate and uh and be less fearful about um getting entangled with each other not in repeating problematic colonial kind of patterns but actually uh, in a different way which i felt really in the spirit thanks thank you and nadia um i think i can uh, agree with uh, all conclusion with uh, in this uh, but um yeah uh, this is a, a good uh, uh, discussion uh, and i think we can uh, share uh, many many information uh, through uh, this di discussion but uh, uh, i uh, conclude that uh, we all uh, learning from the past uh, for a better future uh, in our uh, cities and uh, architecture okay. thank you uh, ima and dani yeah uh, hopefully right now we are uh, moving forward to post fossil transformation and i think it will lead us to uh, intensive change and changing and transformation uh, is not always a word that people like but i think um, for that i think we need um, the idea of working interdisciplinary so that by uh, facing this transformation uh, is quite scary, but we need to get people to feel not uh, not feeling alone, but we are together to 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 bring something new emerge. And, and maybe I add something. Um, basically, if we talk about technology, it, the nature of technology is actually exclusive, right? So uh, what yeah. we should do with technology is actually we should make it more inclusive. So people in the middle in the middle to 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 down class i think they should be experience the new new kind of technology so they can uh, get the the benefit they can get the the uh, yeah i mean uh, the advantage of the technology for their uh, daily life thank you thank you and finally nani well i really <laughs> <laughs> I really enjoyed. Thanks a lot uh, to the initiators. And uh, well, everything has already been said. Um, we have to connect everything. Learning from each other is so imp important. Learning from other perspectives. I really enjoyed also her he hearing from former logics. I quite like the design a lot and <laughs> wish there would be more um, exchange and uh, well, working interdisciplinary, this is also something we really try uh, to uh, try to do and which is quite interesting and important. Well, thanks a lot. <laughs> thank you. Well, I just want to end this by uh, saying thank you. But before that, I want to quote Walter Gropius. He said, our guiding principles was that design is neither an intellectual nor a material affair but simply as an integral part of the stuff of life necessary for everyone in a civilized society. So I think that is something uh, that echoing the spirit of this uh, uh, discussions tonight. So 
I invite you to attend the second uh, online symposiums on the 15th of December uh, 2022, uh, Narratives, Archives and Knowledge Transfer, Making History Accessible. I think that will make uh, our discussions even more uh, deeper into this relationship between uh, narratives and, and, and knowledge transfer. And also to the exhibition, if you are happen in Jakarta, I'm sorry, I couldn't go to, I cannot go to Jakarta, but for those in Indonesia, uh, from the 12th of December to 12th of January, 2023, uh, there's an exhibition uh, related to these topics in Taman Ismail Marzuki, Jakarta Art Center in Cikini, Jakarta. So welcome to the exhibitions. So for that, um, I thank you everybody uh, for um, sitting nicely in the last three hours. And hopefully what we discussed today uh, uh, give us a new inspirations and also some um, you know, resolutions about the, what is your next step uh, that in your life that you want to achieve in this, uh, to heal uh, the, the planet Earth. Also at the same time, also to fulfill the promise to the next generations that we will take care of this, uh, uh, this uh, city architecture and, and planet uh, to be passed on to the next generations in a better conditions. So thank you. So I return this to, um, uh, uh, the committee, uh, Sally <laughs> or whoever, to okay, close the, the sessions. Yeah, yeah, I cannot say any more because Johannes, it was the perfect um, ending of this wonderful three hours. Thank you very much. Hope to see you soon again, and let's stay connected. I think some of you already chatted, and Philip sent me an interesting contact in Indonesia. So um, the work goes on. See you. Stay healthy.